Hello, everybody. Welcome, greetings. Hi, hello, howdy, hey. My name is Zine. Welcome to the Urquan Masters 30 Year Look Back. Uh, you might be if you if you are familiar with the game and you're here through Pistol Shrimp or any of the media or anything that's gone out there, then welcome. Greetings. This is my channel, and I am Zine. That's why the name is on the channel. It, it, anyway, I am your awkward host and also uh, a, a huge fan of this game and this enterprise. And uh, for those of you who might be just tuning in or, or need a quick refresher, Urquan Masters is a game that is turning 30 years old. It was released in 1992, uh, originally as Star Control 2, uh, the Urquan Masters, and uh, has been around since then, influencing a great number of uh, franchises and developers and really just a part of the DNA. Of, uh, of game history, and particularly open world space development, that sort of thing. Uh, recognized by IGN, GameSpot, Kotaku, PC Gamer, as uh, some of, w one of the most, uh, goodness gracious, best games of all time. Like, just I'm trying to think like through all the things. Best games of all time, uh, it, it is highly celebrated. And uh, they, they also did a, something that's kind of remarkable that I just I really feel like needs to be called out, which is that they chose to release the game into the wild, into open source, I believe in 2002, which allowed it to continue to be updated by fans and, and, and people who uh, really enjoyed and appreciated the art. And uh, so it is still available and playable today on even modern systems, which is not something that can be said for many 30-year-old games. It's not many. It's not often that you can just go grab a game that old and just have it run immediately on your current Windows system. So uh, we are, just a quick preface, again, I'm Zine. There's going to be several of us that are in the call and, and having a kind of a look back as I play and die and, and you guys get to make fun of me through my normal gameplay while they discuss, etc., but uh, I do want to be clear that you know this is this is a labor of love, and so we're not so we're not looking for high production value. We're not looking you know this is not a refined set. I am just here and and kind of telling you what's on my mind and what's occurring to me. That's what they're going to be doing. We're just going to be having a casual conversation because partly because you know there's a whole lot of other life going on. In fact, uh, one of the cool things that I did not know until we started down this is they have founded a new development company, Pistol Shrimp which is actually working on a sequel to our beloved game, to uh, Star Control 2 or Urquan Masters. Uh, be, get, you can do the licensing and stuff like that. It will be known as Urquan Masters 2. Maybe you'll get a, the, uh, you'll get some of them to talk about it a little bit or, or to chat or, or give some feedback. Maybe not. I don't know. I can't tell you where the game is or what's going on, what's going to happen, but I can tell you who all is here. So let's see if we can't bring everybody in and uh, hopefully have all this just work nice and seamlessly. Otherwise, it will all go horribly, at which point you can make fun of me and blame me and I'll take all the blame. Um, I'm happy to do so. So let's see who we've got here. Let's. Hello, uh, gentlemen. How are you all today? Good. Good to be here. Welcome. Yes. Welcome. Let me adjust volume. Hello from slightly. Paul. Hello. All right. So to introduce people, we have Paul Ritchie here, who is the co-founder of Toys for Bob, along with Fred Ford, and uh, was the designer, writer, and artist for the original Urquan Masters. Hello, Paul. Hey there! I was I was one of the design one of the designers, writers, and artists. Okay, and, I, I mean, uh, it's a, but no, it's that's a team okay. Effort. There was just a cast of thousands. Sure, but thank you very much. Of course, and then we have Fred Ford, uh, also a co-founder of Toys for Bob, one of thousands of co-founders, I'm assuming, uh, with with <laughs> yes. Paul and, uh, and Crestlings all one of the lead I'll, programmers. Although I, I was the only programmer. Oh, oh, okay. I, I think right. so. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, we have Errol Otis as well, a longtime collaborator with Paul and uh, going all the way back to Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of thing. Writer, artist, musician, and you were also a voice actor in the 3DO version of Urquan Masters, I believe? I think so. <laughs> you think so? I think so, so yes. That's fair Very enough. true. And then Ken Ford, brother of Fred Ford and also a collaborator uh, and programmer. Yes, I, I programmed on the 3DO version, but um, not the original. Yeah, version. I mean, I, I heard Fred claiming all credit, and I was like, well, I know, this, I know. this well, is going to be interesting down there, but I assumed it was sibling rivalry kind of involved. Yeah, so. it's been that way my whole life. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and then we also have Pebby, who is a, a fellow Twitch streamer, by the way, and uh, Dan Gerstein, who has also been a longtime collaborator uh, from about the 2000s on for Toys for Bob and is one of the developers in the upcoming sequels. So hello, Pebby. Hello, thank you for having me and all of us. Yeah. So, uh, as I was kind of explaining, this is we're, we're not going for extreme production value here. We're just looking for a casual conversation to kind of look back and talk about the game and that is that is uh, influenced so many different uh, developers and, and people and has just been so widely acclaimed. 
Um, obviously, after 30 years, uh, you know, there's a lot of the a lot of the kids out there that might not be familiar with it, which is, but it's actually a good opportunity because I I personally feel like the game still holds up to this day. I know everybody everybody who loves the game says that, but I genuinely still play the game. I I have I, I streamed it a little while ago. Um, and, uh, uh, I, again, it's not just nostalgia talking, like it is genuinely a good playable game to this day, which is just fascinating. Uh, so again, welcome, hi, howdy, and all of those things. And, uh, so I don't know, uh, from here, we kind of got to figure out how we want to go about things and what we want to do. I'm going to be playing the game very poorly in the background on the side. Well, you guys can either, we can talk through what's happening in the game, or uh, if you want to just kind of go into what started the the whole process for for you, uh, Paul and Fred. Like, where did, where did this come from? And, and kind of what, tell us about the beginnings. Sure, I'll start off. Um, so I made games with... Uh, Errol in high school, and then at TSR, uh, again with Errol and uh, many other great people there. And then after that, I came back to California and I worked with John Freeman and Ann Westfall on some of Electronic Arts first games, Archon and Murder on the Zender Nerf, and later Mail Order Monsters with Evan and Nikki Robinson. After that, I took a short pause from games to work in advertising and then came to my senses and was sort of put on a blind date with Fred Ford in, I think, 1988, late 1988. And we decided to, um, he, he had also been looking for um, a change of life and into making games again. And so we formed a, a small company, just the two of us, called Toys for Bob. And I had already signed a three game deal with Accolade, uh, which was great because it was job security. But I was just one designer and I had signed up to make three games. So I desperately needed a programmer. <laughs> and that was where Fred came in. And one of the three games, the first one that we were gonna work on was, was called Star Control, uh, even from the beginning. And that was because um, I originally pitched a, a variant of the idea to Electronic Arts. And I called it Star Trek, Archon over the phone, or Starcon, and uh, that's sort of how that came to pass. We, and it was just Starcon.exe for a while on DOS, and then um, you know Fred and I began working together and uh, sort of finished the first game, uh, which was just Star Control, and then we decided to start working on the sequel. And I'm going to let Fred pick it up from there. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you a little background on me, too. I, I did games uh, before I met Paul, but then uh, decided to take my computer science degree into Silicon Valley because that seemed like the responsible thing to do. But I got I got bored of that, and I was actually working at a company with Errol and Ken at that time. And um, uh, when I decided that uh, I wanted to get back to making games. And so Errol was kind of the one, one of the people who, who put us two together. Um, Wish I could Paul, remember that. Yeah, <laughs> Paul had grown up with him and Errol uh, had recommended me to Paul. Um, and so then we started working together and uh, did Star Control 1. And that was just sort of getting up to speed and learning each other's ha work habits and how to iterate best together on making a game and um uh so star control one was a little maybe perhaps more limited than we would have normally done if we had already had an established working relationship uh but then we decide to reach for the stars as it were in star control two uh, or quad masters and um we <laughs> we made that game and it it was a it was a long process well, you guys actually uh, ended up running out of budget with the accolade, didn't you? And didn't it become self-funded towards the end? That is true. Um, they they were mainly a sports game company, but certainly not a science fiction adventure game company. And they they didn't recognize where we were exactly headed with uh, with the game, and so became impatient with us when we missed our contractual deadlines and decided, well. We just won't pay you anymore then and uh <laughs> and so yes we we had to self-fund for the last six months technically it was fred funded um and uh, i'm very appreciative of that uh and we spent i don't know six more months working on the project uh they they kept wanting to publish it before it was even remotely done uh and we kept saying no and back in those days 
just there was no network. They couldn't get the version unless we drove down there and gave them a floppy disk or two. That's uh, that's actually pretty. I mean, obviously, that's going out on a limb. That's that and uh, really sticking your necks out for for the game and and for the vision that you believed in. And I think ultimately, as you know, since we're here 30 years later, I think it ultimately was the right decision to wait until you had it complete and had it what you wanted it to be. Um, was there a lot that you feel like that you weren't able to include that you wish you could have, or or things that you know kind of got left behind in that rush and in, in as the deadlines loomed? I think we we did most everything we wanted to do. We had a couple of other little things we considered, and some people have found them, you know, by digging through the uh, the actual executable. But we we did a game that we were happy with and we felt was complete and that had been play tested both in Melee as well as in the adventure game quite a bit. But when we had the opportunity to do uh, a kind of a remake for the 3DO, we did fix a couple of bugs and we added voice all the way through the game and we remastered some of the music and uh, there were, gosh, there were, oh, and I, we added an alternative um, kind of graphical uh, icon-based system for the menus uh, inside of just the text menus if you wanted it. And I think those options are both available on the open source version. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned that you fixed some bugs. I I wanted to like I don't know what uh, whether there's a contact email at Pistol Shrimp or what, but I would like to complain about the infinite lander bug being resolved. That was always a go-to <laughs> for me on on any startup to uh, uh, sell off that lander initially and then uh, get make a little money and get my ship on its way. You know, so when I it was a it was a dash of cold water when I started the 3DO version. I was like, wait, I can't do that anymore. I have to actually go and earn my money. This is terrible. The 3DO version was actually an accident. Uh, we, uh, after after we did Star Control 2, uh, Accolade wanted us to do Star Control 3 uh, for the same amount of contractual money that we, that wasn't enough for Star, for Star Control 2. And besides being a little fatigued with uh, the Star Control or Quan Masters at that point, uh, we also had another game we were working on at that or wanted to work on at that time called the horde and so we we separated from accolade at that point went to work at crystal dynamics and started making the horde and uh the uh, crystal dynamics wanted us to make a sega cd version and um so we hired a couple of people away from the same company that errol and ken had been working at with with me and uh literally on the day before they were to show up after having quit their jobs uh that project got canceled the sega cd project and uh so we felt besides feeling really bad about having them quit their jobs we we uh we licensed our own game back back from accolade uh to do the 3do version in its place yeah, there's uh, certainly some interesting back and forth with the rights and the naming and, and who owns what, and you know that that's always fun uh, arguments and discussions for the 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 lawyers and such. But ultimately, if I'm understanding, while uh, Accolade was has retained the the name Star Control, you guys pretty much uh, had control of all the assets and, and story and, and characters. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yeah, basically. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, generally that's right, and that's what you know we're moving forward with on the sequel, uh, Urkon Masters Two, which is a working name. I don't know that we've said that publicly, but it's it's somewhat uninspiring, uh, but but it's a working title. We'll come up with a cool new title at some point. Uh, but yeah, that's so we're taking the story, uh, characters, um, and uh, kind of just picking right up from where we left off last time. Uh, I think I think we've said this. Dan may scream at me at some point here uh, on what we have and haven't discussed publicly. But the for me anyway, the intent for someone picking up our Quan Masters two and playing it is this is what you expect to have seen in 1994, maybe 1993, mm -hmm. provided that the graphics were higher resolution and the audio was was great and. And that you had you know good network to play with others uh, i i really didn't want to try to reimagine 
what this game could be like post Mass Effect and all of the great science fiction games that have been done since then. I very much want to complete the sort of the series that we started, or at least take it to another nice new conclusion. And uh, for me, that meant fulfilling a lot of the same uh, structure and uh, I don't want to say systems because that's not entirely true, but uh, a lot of the same fundamental Star Trek like experiences or, you know, the sort of star. I think I feel like Starflight pioneered this style of game. So I'm just going to come out and credit Greg and the crew at Binary Systems. Um, but I really do want it to feel like a totally organic, connected experience. Well, I don't think anybody who's a current fan is going to complain about uh, having that come through and, and just getting, you know, I, I assume not exactly more of the same, but still a continuation of, of something that has lasted this long and, and everybody has enjoyed this much. So I think there's a lot of excitement uh, uh, with the fan base for, for that next step. Um, you guys mentioned uh, Starflight is one of the uh, inspirations, and, and I believe that uh, one of the main developers of Starflight actually ended up helping out with the, the game. Is that correct? Yes, that was Greg Johnson. Greg Johnson. Uh, he was the, the lead designer uh, and writer uh, of uh, uh, Starflight and right. Starflight 2. And, and he wrote uh, some of the dialogue. Uh, in, in one case, Errol um, wrote up some very fundamental thoughts about the ores on a piece of uh, yellow note paper. The happy campers. And then got... And then that got handed to Greg, and he just ran with it. And um, Greg also, you know, we were doing work in deluxe paint uh, on the Amiga for Electronic Arts and for anybody else who would hire us to do art for a while. So we were drawing spaceships. And um, and then he did actually some voice acting as well uh, in the 3DO version. Well, yeah, and, uh, you know, speaking of influences, you guys have mentioned, uh, I believe uh, uh, several of you have, have talked about uh, Dungeons & Dragons and involvement there. Is is there Are there elements of Dungeons & Dragons and, and that that have influenced and helped to kind of crept into the game? I mean, obviously one is fantasy, one is sci-fi, but uh, would you say there's crossover pieces or little bits that you would say tie in? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I tend to see the world in terms of monsters and treasure to begin with. But I, I think the idea of leaving kind of this world behind for a, for a little bit and going to a place that fulfills some of the fantasies that come from media that you've experienced, whether it's books you read or comics or movies, um, and that just didn't exist before Dungeons & Dragons. I mean, I played teletype games, uh, but... I don't think people understand how just the void there was in alternative experiences and um, outside of reading and the occasional bad science fiction film. But Dungeons and Dragons allowed for this blossoming explosion of imagination and, and, and in Errol's case, fantastic artistry and as well as great imagination. And it was like this enormous vacuum that just sucked me right into it and um i felt happier there these were people i understood and who i felt like understood me and a lot of us <laughs> had the desire to make a business out of it even in high school and that's that's where errol came in so errol uh you know you've been pretty quiet as well uh, why don't uh you kind of give us your your background story with in relation to star control 2 and uh uh, you know, how you how it's affected you or, you know, I mean, just what what are your thoughts and, and involvement and in, in where you really came in and, and it affected you? <clears throat> OK, uh, let's see, maybe uh, go back to the almost the beginning, but not make it too long. Yeah, Paul and I uh, met in high school and played some D&D. &D, and it was interesting, as he said, I was just thinking about the very first moment that I started playing it. And, and you know, nobody yelled hurrah and got really excited, but we all kind of felt like um, there would be nothing else. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know, some the combination of the imagination, the opportunity to like be creative combined with leveling. I don't know, that was the first time I experienced leveling, where the more you played the game, the more powerful you got, it was genius. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we made some books and uh, I was sending an artwork to TSR's uh, Dragon Magazine and they hired me. Um, 
as an artist there when they, they uh, needed one, lost one, needed one. And Paul came out and uh, as a designer and worked there for a while. And then we left and uh, Paul was um, working on uh, a video games, uh, Archon, which was so cool. And um, I started working after a few years, yeah, with, with Paul and Fred at a company that made paint systems, computer paint systems and uh, desktop publishing systems. And I was there for seven or eight years, but during that time I was still interested uh, and drawn to gaming and did some freelance stuff. I did some artwork for uh, Starflight, which was uh, Starflight 2. Jeez, I get them one and two, but yeah, that was very cool. And uh, that kind of led to uh, me working on Star Control 2 because I was uh, uh, helping them play test it. Um, battling in Star Control 1 and when they started working on Star Control 2 and wanted some artwork and other things, um, I joined in um, as a freelancer and that was quite wonderful. And what was the question again? <laughs> uh, mainly just, you know, like how, how did you get involved? What were, you know, I mean, I, I think you, you covered it fairly well and uh, don't worry about filling time. Like the more, the more you, you guys talk and, and expand on things, one, the, the, the more that everyone listening gets to kind of learn and, and see the, the, mm -hmm, the crap mm -hmm. that went into this, but also too, the less I've got to try and figure out like, how do I keep this feeling natural oh, yeah. and flowing yeah. without, well, well also, you know, like, you know, uh, you, the less you depend on me, the better you guys are going to be. So, uh, you know, feel free to talk amongst yourselves and carry the conversation and, and let me All take right. a nap. Uh, maybe I'll just, uh, couple other thoughts that sure. was pretty interesting because i was working full time but it was that company was marin in marin county and they were just up the road so it actually worked out pretty good i would uh, speed on the highway up there during lunchtime and uh, talk with them and and uh, go over things and um, uh, yeah so that, that art was made with uh, mostly with traditional um media but I did do a couple also, I think in deluxe paint, the Utwig and the Bukunk. Um, but most of the other ones were scanned paintings. And um, yeah, that was burning the candle both when, and this is kind of extraneous, but I, one strong memory was I was rushing around so much. I wolfed down a, 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 a Subway meatball sandwich one day and had to go to the hospital uh, because I had eating it so fast it got stuck anyway i um, didn't do that <laughs> yeah 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 no no that was it was mind-blowing like i i i just you know rub, 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 ate it like it was gone in a second and i got home and anyway yeah i had to go to the hospital um but uh the other thing that was really fun was uh doing the urquan uh music i had an emulator to uh, uh sampler synthesizer and i had the sequencer on there and uh put that together and I can't even remember how they got that into the game. Do I you? believe that you gave me the sample files. Okay. And, and I wrote the world's most horrible down sampler. Uh, and I think I used an Amiga program and that's a crazy thing I wrote. And then we sat in a uh, mod edit, you know, mm -hmm. I can't remember which of the mod editing programs and essentially did it by ear and i think we played it back for you once or twice and you know it was it was awesome if you hadn't heard the original i had heard the original hi-fi and i was like oh my god this sounds not as good as yours well it worked out it worked out pretty good but yeah there was something about i don't know how to describe it the inflection of the notes that wasn't the same but the basic the idea got through the idea got through yeah yeah, the uh, the music in the game is it uses the old mod files as you were you were saying, and uh, I mean that was that was also something that contributed significantly to uh, some of the longevity that's involved because uh, the mod files could be it, it's an interesting format, and you know again kids these days as I shake my cane at them, but uh, it was one of the first things that you could you could actually download a free program. There were lots of mod editors, and and open up the file, and you'd see the samples that were involved in it. You'd be able to you could you could see how the notes were created and so you there uh, there's a uh, a vibrant remix uh kind of uh culture and and uh you know kind of setup that's behind all that that our community i guess is the word i'm looking for that uh, has created and taken a lot of that music and gone in a, a, a lot of different directions because of how that was open and accessible 
Yeah, that was, we stumbled onto that playing some of uh, games from Europe, mostly. I think we were playing like Lemmings and then uh, Blood, Blood, Blood Money. Money. Yeah. Awesome soundtrack in Blood Money. And that led us to try to find out how on earth are they doing such awesome music? Um, because the normal music file format, which was pioneered at Electronic Arts, wasn't very cool by comparison. So we actually tore them out of other people's games to try to figure it out. And then that led us off on a journey to Finland. Fred, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah. So the, the mod scene, I think, started over in Europe. And um, uh, really what, what led us there was we wanted to do digitized sound in a game because we I'd implemented a a uh, feature on the PC, which was being able to play digitized sound out of this the PC speaker, which which was a pain, but was was really neat at the time because everything kind of before that had been synthesized sounds on the PC, and so when we realized we could play digitized sounds, uh, then we then we and we found the the mod format that was uh, was just too hard to resist that, and people were making things. From them, so we could, we could. Uh, I implemented a mod player that I found in, uh, on the on the the budding net at that point, and uh, it was in Finnish. It was well, it was written in C, but all the comments and variable names were in Finnish, and so that that was part of the reverse engineering, just as much as the the C code was. So we started using this cool audio format, and I had worked with um, synthesized musicians, you know, musicians who would make stuff to work on the ad lib or on the CMS, and and th there were new sound boards coming out. We could see them coming, like the Gravis ultrasound. And, uh, but what we didn't have was musicians, because it turned out that none of the traditional musicians I'd worked with had any understanding of what mods were because it's half programming and so that's what led us to a desperate search for mod musicians around the world by virtue of uh, a music competition that we conducted that's uh I mean, it, it's just it's so interesting to to hear back and think back on just how different the landscape was and and all the things we take for granted now uh, going back to then, like you said, the Gravis ultrasound. I remember the the sound blaster coming out, and you know you have to figure out, t tell the game, you know which IRQ the sound blaster is working on, and its DMA access port and all that, it, to, just to get sound even out of a computer. So um, it, it's to have have this game be, you know, as as strong, uh, have as good as a soundscape as it does, is really a credit to uh, Errol and and just you guys and the implementation and decisions and stuff. Although again, you know, it, all things come back to ores, and I that that uh, that that sound that soundtrack's a, an interesting one. That that one, uh, I I was like listening to back to the tracks of what can I have as background music, that sort of thing, and I got to the ores one, and I was like, maybe I'm not gonna play this one in particular. I don't know that we'd be able to talk over it. It kind of demands your attention in a in a very interesting way. Was that? Uh, I think that's by Eric Berg, if I recall. Okay. And um, his music, he had a couple of pieces. I, I hope I've got that right. I loved his pieces because of his crazy instrument choice and how fun and positive they were. And that combination just spoke of the oars to me. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it definitely matches them and in, in the, the race that they are. But uh, it, again, it's it, to me, it's just it's so creative. And I, I don't want to sound like dismissive in a, in a negative way. Like, it's just... I, I was like, what's good, you know, nice background, we're talking over music, and, and that one is like, nope, that's forefront, and you've got to pay attention when that thing's on, because it's like, your brain's, how does this work? And so, uh, you know, much respect to being able to put it together and, and to find a theme that's so perfect for a very interesting uh, race and, and, and interestingly written race that you've created. Each race... Well, it's interesting how you're characterizing the music both as being like some of the tracks leap into the front and some of them sit in the back and it's hard to remember that when we first did the game there was no voice so the music had to carry everything there was text on screen and music so the music could be really full and fill kind of your experience field and then when we brought in voice you know we had to duck the sound way down every time we brought voice in but then 
recently someone did a, an, a, a study of what happened to the original melee music because the melee music that everybody knows now uh, was created by Dan Nicholson, but we did have a contest winner who had sent us some melee music and it was a really great piece. It just was full. It was really rich and it filled up the sound field so much, and this is just in my opinion, that all of the weapon effects couldn't push through as much as I wanted them to. And I did want some sense of pause and um, pacing in battle when ships separated. Mm -hmm. But when you had this just like driving soundtrack through the whole thing, there was never any of that. So that's how Dan's piece ended up getting in there. Well, uh, I mean, judging just from chat and people's responses and stuff, I, I think the music really came through and, and uh, connected with a lot of people and just, again, brought the, brought everything alive because in the original version, as you said, there was no... Uh, uh, there was no voice acting. The voice acting was added for the 3DO version itself. So, um, and uh, so as the game came out, like what, uh, how was reception once we talked about how, you know, it was delayed and, and uh, you had to kind of sell fun towards the end. How was reception once it was released? Did you, were, were you overwhelmed with success? Was it, you know, a slow burn or are you still bitter that it not enough, not more people saw it? Kind of where did you guys all land? Uh, with release, There's, I don't. Well, I'll, I'll I'll start off. I don't have any bitterness <laughs> at all. Um, you know, the game was really uh, the game that Fred and I wanted to make above all else. And then finding out that our, you know, friends had all the talents necessary to flesh it out. Um, animation was the one place we brought in a heavy hitter. Um, but. So I, I think that the game got great creative reviews, you know, critical reviews. Uh, it, it, the reviews liked what we wanted them to like. And, uh, but with a very focused uh, experience, something that isn't broad, uh, something that requires reading, something that uses a crazy ass navigation control system, which is to say inertial, uh, we knew that we weren't going to be hitting everybody. And so the sales were not staggering. Um, they were okay, but they weren't staggering. Uh, certainly nothing like test drive, which is what we were sort of being compared against at the time. So, but, but I think that we were happy with what we did and we had immediately moved on to the horde and working on the 3DO. So that sort of captured our attention, but it wasn't, I mean, we knew we had a fan base, but we, we hired our very first intern, Chris Nelson, uh, from Boston University, and he wanted to help take the code base and move it into open source. He was sort of the, the, the person who made that happen. And then Fred worked on it and Chris worked on it, and then it was turned over to the open source community. And that was when we really saw and understood the depth of commitment by the fans because not only were there the people who were working on the code itself, but people were then experiencing the new version, the open source version, and talking about their fan experience. And so that was the first time that I realized how much of an impact we'd really had. And uh, that's what the big reward for me has been. Anyone else wanna, wanna throw in on that one or, or is Paul owning that entire, that entire response? I think I think we also ran into Wing Commander, which was pretty uh -huh. uh, a pretty novel take on space at the time, um, and that stole some of our thunder. Uh, just just the Wing Commander series. Well, I, that that can happen. There's always other games coming out and stuff. But uh, I again, you guys, I, I, it's interesting because as you're describing stuff, there there's things that. I want to talk about that I don't know that everyone in the audience, but it's like, I, I think of Test Drive and, and you're mentioning Test Drive and I'm like, I remember playing Test Drive, I remember going through it. And so to think that you're be, this game is being compared to that is it's, it's, it's not even apples and oranges. It's yeah, there, I need something, you know, fundamentally different uh, from that because Test Drive had so, so you know, no story, so little immersion and it was, you know, it was fun in what it was, but this is, this is positively grandiose comparatively. And so, uh, it, it's it's interesting how I mean partly it's I, I assume for the media and the press they had to kind of take what was there as far as games and what were coming out to to do comparisons to kind of say here's here's what's the what but uh, man th those those do not line up at all in terms of <laughs> how much immersion and and I think longevity uh, really really came about I mean obviously driving games as a genre continued on 
But I don't think uh, you know anyone's really celebrating the anniversary of the original test drive at this point. Well, as you said at the beginning too, though we we open source this, so it's mm. it's had the opportunity to live on in uh, in ways that those other games haven't really. So I don't one thing to... I'll Go say ahead. about the the development and the appearance of the indie community is how much more. Uh, there was a place for the people who are willing to make that commitment to their idea and to not constantly having to address the mass market and say, we need to make this broader because every new person that can relate to this is a new potential dollar. You know, that that was really what you were struggling against in publishing with the few large publishers that were around. And that was pretty much the only game in town. With the indie distribution and with electronic distribution, you're just getting people who go all in on their idea. And that's why I think so many of their games are so emotionally touching, compelling. I mean, you can't get away from the fact that if you spend $100 million on a game with a bunch of talented people, you're going to have something moving in a way. But when you have someone who's just like, I don't care how many people love this game. I'm making this thing because I've got to do it. And I, you know, I, I have faith that someone out there will like it. Uh, and so... To me, you know, the games that I play now are almost entirely indie. And I tend to obsess on a small number of games. I don't have a really broad experience. But I think one of the biggest improvements over the last 30 years is not the technology, but the allowing people with vision and uh, courage to make the games they want to make. What uh, the, again, I mean, for, for, this is pretty much for all of you. What games do you say you still play if you still play games? And uh, what are some current ones that really have your attention or, or current or recent, I guess? Well, we always have to go to Ken uh, about what games you play. <laughs> I don't play current games. You know, I, I, it, it's funny because I feel sometimes like the black sheep. I'm not a huge science fiction fan. I'll say that up front. Um, and I'm not a huge gamer. And the game, the game I go back to, play again and again is i play fan missions for thief and thief 2 that's that's like my go-to here's what i'm gonna play so if you if you talk to me about like wow these are the this game has the coolest graphics i'm like you know to me that that isn't what i'm looking for i'm looking for a fun game i i played star control for thief 2 <laughs> well I, I played star control 2 all the way through the 3do version because i worked on the 3do version but it's you know and i enjoyed it but it uh and but part of it is because i enjoy being around paul and fred obviously i've been following fred from company to company for decades and i've worked with paul most of the time for the last 30 years too so um i love these guys um what, about you, so Earl? Could, what are you playing yeah what, what do I play? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I've been keeping up. I, I got bit by the, uh, the MMO bug back with EverQuest. And uh, I've been playing different ones constantly since whenever that was 90. So are you in on uh, uh, World of Warcraft right now or the new release? I've, that's one I've never played. Interesting. That is the one I've never played. And I don't want to say anything controversial, but initially when I looked at it, I... The art style didn't grab me. I wanted something more, less. Uh, although I, I love a lot of those other uh, Blizzard games. Um, yeah, no, like, you world. know, uh, uh, what, what did what did it come from? Yeah, but but yeah, so so I've been playing those constantly, um, and still do. EverQuest, huh? I was I was an Ultima online guy, so you know I. I... We, uh, you know, water and oil, but uh, I won't hold that too much against Ultima you. Online was that the little the little people? I I don't, don't know if I can describe it as little people. It was uh, it was the medieval one. It was kind of the original. Uh, EverQuest came uh, after it, and then Ashes yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, we're all the rather than they were like everyone was real tiny on the screen, right? I think so i don't i mean I, I i don't think of it as such it was an isometric view and i i think feel like people were scaled appropriately but again <laughs> i don't i don't have your level of perception or memory so no no, no i i, I did yeah, think I remember that. that because i bought it one christmas and played it my son at the time uh, uh couldn't stop laughing because i got killed by a chicken uh-huh uh -huh, and he, yeah. you know he's like my dad the game developer my dad the guy who played dungeons and dragons way too much killed by a chicken killed by and a i chicken. still hear about that he's 40 and i still <laughs> anyway the um it's um, oh i was gonna ask dan 
plays probably more games than all of us put together. Dan, what, what games have you been playing recently that you like? The Urquan Masters 2. It's very exclusive access. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, honestly, this was this was a kickback to you, Paul, because one of the one of the things um, there's a fan fan mod for for Urquan Masters that uh, randomizes and makes a lot of different uh, changes to procedural generation. And I know, speaking of being bitten by bugs, we've both been bitten by uh, various roguelike, I'm glad we have a phrase for it now, various roguelike games. And uh, we've probably, I feel like you and I together have probably talked more about Stardew Valley and Slay the Spire <laughs> than almost any game in the past couple of years, maybe Factorio. Yeah, I for me, Stardew Valley was, <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was magnificent. I went into it because Dan told me like 10 times, Paul, you have to play this. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I like that art style and I don't know. And then I played it and I was at a weird state in my life where, you know, throwing myself into that game uh, for a long time, more than I'll say on this phone, on this, uh, this uh, Twitch stream. I... That and then I play out there Omega a lot. Whenever I feel good about my life and that everything's going smoothly, I go and play that stuff <laughs> and I die and I die and I die and I run out of air and then I die. Anyway, I love that game. Stardew Valley definitely uh, is is an example and you're mentioning that you're really into the indie games and I think that's one of the prime examples of uh, a successful indie developer really, you know, again, going in and pushing boundaries and doing things that a traditional publisher and, and uh, uh, development house isn't going to take risk on or, or really kind of see that vision. And uh, so I can see exactly why that would grab you. So that's uh, that's pretty cool to hear. For um, Stardew Valley fans, I will share a, a, a daughter anecdote. So I am in London right now, staring out the window at London night because my daughter had uh, a boy about a week and a half ago. And so I'm here hanging out with my new grandson. And she had a friend who knows her well, and they hadn't talked for a couple of months. And so she had just given birth to her son and her friend called up and he said, look, I know this is a big day for you. And I know things, this is really important, but I just want you to know, I got to Ginger Island in Stardew Valley. <laughs> And so she wasn't quite in the mood to hear that, I think, that day, but I really appreciate that guy's sense of humor. This isn't this isn't gonna hit right now, but at some point you're gonna appreciate this and look where look where I got. So <laughs> congratulations uh to her and to you and, and everything. So that's really cool as well and exciting. Um so again, the uh the game is very is very open and that's one of the things that grabbed me and and really just I mean even right now as I'm as I'm doing my my poor playthrough just while you guys are talking, you know, I'm I'm still in the soul system, but you just you kind of make your decision of where you want to go and and uh what's what happens to be there and, and where you find. Um, what kind of pushed you guys in that direction? And it, it, it could, because the whole idea of an open world, I, I don't know that it existed prior to this. And I, uh, you know, this is, that was pretty groundbreaking to go nonlinear like that. So, uh, um, take it away, Fred. Yeah. How, how did, how did that happen? Well, uh, kind of necessity is the mother of invention in many ways. And when there's, when there's only two of us, a designer and an engineer, um, and we want to make an expansive game, we have to come up with shortcuts or time-saving uh, ways to do things. And so uh, one, of, one of the fantasies is to be able to go to many different planets. And, uh, and so we had, I had, we had to figure out how to, to generate uh, planets uh, programmatically. And... Um, Paul Paul went through uh, a big design of of how a planet could would be composed of its atmosphere and and uh, minerals and whatnot based on its distance from the stars, and he went he went very deep. Uh, I I don't know how I got him out of that hole, but um, eventually uh, we decided that yes, we're going to programmatically generate them, but we don't necessarily need to to go to that depth because people won't appreciate how deep you went here, Paul. And Unless um, they tune in for the 30th anniversary and they <laughs> get a half hour to explain how it Yeah, is. but but anyway, it sort of set the, t the table for, for programmatically generating a planet. 
and its its characteristics. Uh, although we did we didn't go as deep as he initially went to do that, but once we were able to do that to generate the planet and its characteristics, and then from that generate its its uh, uh, appearance, um, we pretty much could have as many planets as we wanted because they were all generated from a consistent random seed. Uh, and so that really opened up the world for us once we could do that. And then it was mostly a matter of figuring out where to, to place the things that weren't generated so that the story could make sense as you progressed. It uh, it's really interesting to see and and how you know to kind of hear how that came together because again, we I, I feel like these days we take for granted just how many of these problems are, are solved and and not even thought about where you guys are encountering it for the first time going how wait, how do we do this you know and, and uh, kind of originating and pioneering methodology for that. Um, I know that on the the planets and such, like the I, I, I'd assume it's you know you, the layout was probably procedurally generated, but in terms of the resources and stuff, is that hand placed? Because I know it doesn't. It, it's certainly, or does it just procedurally generate off of the same seed for every playthrough, so that you end up with the same uh, resources? Every it time? is. It is consistent based yes. on Fred's Fred's random generation. However, if I want to just celebrate some of the star and planet calculation. Uh, there are planet types that have distributions of elements and yeah. the, the size of the sun and the temperature of the sun affects the density. So uh, sure. And then one tenth of one percent of things are manually placed. Like there's a uh, I'm sorry Fred if we're talking over each other. But uh, like in on Pluto, for example, uh, you know, there was an exotic element that I put down there to sort of, I think, attract your attention to make sure you went down and, and found FWIFO mm -hmm. there. But uh, the vast majority of it was randomly done. And so when we we realized that we didn't exactly know where all of the best <laughs> stuff was. So Fred wrote a program that, that basically dumped text versions of every planet and every resource that was on it into an enormous text file. And then that we then folded into the resource guide uh, and that sort of came about that way. There's a funny story too, because uh, I don't remember why, maybe I was just being cruel, but at some some point towards the end of the project, I had to, I had to change the random seed. I don't, I don't know why that would be, but I, but I did. And uh, that, that wreaked havoc on uh, Accolade's QA department because all of a sudden, all the planets and resources were different from what they had been testing all this time. And so they had to retest every, going to every single planet and relearn the and, game, basically, uh, or yeah. the, 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 the quick routes, at least. Yeah. I can't think of a good reason why I would have had to change that. So I must have just been cruel, is all I can think of. <laughs> I wonder... Very consistent with his behavior otherwise. Fair enough. I wonder, uh, and uh, I had never really considered this, but uh, and I don't know if in the open source, but it might I, like the first thing I think of is, you know, if you if for replayability, would it be interesting to have an ability to generate a new seed or or something different, and and you know, like kind of try have that experience where again, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna go here and pick up these biologicals, but instead, it's like I don't know where things are, and now I have to go find them. That'd be that's uh, the that's the great thing about the open source. Uh, project is that somebody's done that effectively. So it randomizes uh, randomizes the planet certainly, uh, and it randomizes where things are placed. I think I think it tries to uh, to keep them in places where uh, you can still uh, complete the story. But I'm not exactly sure to what lengths they go there. But somebody has done that. That's pretty cool. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, you had an intern that kind of pushed for the open source, uh, the, the idea to open source it and everything like that. Um, obviously, I don't know if there's still, you know, if anyone's still working under threat of, of uh, rod and fist or, or anything, but can you tell us a little about how we, you know, like kind of that, that those, the, the evolution of uh, moving towards the open sourcing, moving away from Accolade and, and uh, kind of what happened in, in those 
those kind of days as you were the, the final days of the star control, your involvement with star control prior to coming back to pistol shrimp. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. well, you go, ahead, Fred. Okay, I will, because I love to talk in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> if you read the transcript, so it, we did an interview with Errol, and mm -hmm. I was just reading through the transcript. I'm just an aside, and I was horrified to see that how much more I talked than Errol did. <laughs> and well, that, that is that's good. That's good, though. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. if it wasn't, I'd cry. So um, we we did the first game, and then immediately we did Star Control Two, the Urquan Masters. Then Fred and I you know, decided, well, we want to do a little game. That was really more than anything else what motivated me, because having worked so hard for so long on the same game, we really wanted to do this little game called The Horde, and Accolade Ac didn't want to do it, um, and so we ended up doing it with Crystal Dynamics. And then we had this opportunity to do the 3DO version, because we desperately needed this project for um, these two guys to work on, and that worked out really well, too. But then we were kind of done. You know, we were moving on into making the first 3D games that we were making. Ken and Fred and I were working on a game called Pandemonium. And so there was a long gap where we would every now and then, you know, do interviews or something like that, or there were retrospectives even back then on, on the game. But it wasn't until Chris showed up that the, the release, the open source release happened. And then I would say starting, gosh, um, starting maybe after the second Skylanders games, because most of you out there may or may not know that that we as a team, all of us here together, worked on Skylanders and uh, made those games happen and invented that whole style of gaming. Uh, but it was about two or three games in where Fred and I began talking seriously about going back and becoming developers again, because at Toys for Bob had grown to more than 100 people. And I was very distant from making games. I was a studio head and and Fred uh, was, you know, the, the CTO, the head of, and he was actually creating tools that people used to make our games at the time. But we talked about going back and we always talked about going back and doing a sequel to the Urquan Masters. And it, as it was sort of rise and fall, depending on how we were feeling about uh, things were going with Activision. And so it, I think it was after the Imaginators, uh, which we're proud of, It was, but it was our last Skylanders game that Fred and I really made the commitment to each other that we need to uh, make sure that we have replacements for our roles running the studio. And uh, after that, we can you know, quietly bow out and go off and work in Fred's garage, or technically above it. OK, cool. Um... All right. Well, uh, as we just uh, every, the the chat is excited because we just met Fwipo, and uh, you know, I I just imagine being the guy that does the playthrough where you just end up fighting and killing Fwipo right off the bat. You never get to really appreciate and enjoy uh, the the long and harmonious relationship you have with the Spathy. Um, so, what the, can you guys talk about? I you know we were talking about the open design and how this was kind of new. What sort of challenges really presented themselves in terms of the storytelling and the elements there, uh, creating something that is as you know non non linear versus just a directed playthrough? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know the the ideas for the whole game developed over its development, but. The idea for the presentation of the dialogue, we started out right at the beginning, and I'm going to back up a little bit. So playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons introduced me to the idea of conversation as a way you tell narrative. Um, I mean, Errol, uh, who, who was the best DM I've ever encountered, uh, you know, he does a lot of uh, sort of describing the, the situation, but a whole lot of it is when you meet characters, you're talking with them about what's happening. And you're tr and it's goal oriented. It isn't just yammering. You know, you're trying to like find out what's happening. Where's the treasure? Where's the monsters? And so that introduced this idea to me of sort of how you structure a conversation in it with with game mechanics built into it. And of course, there was the choose your own adventures uh, books. And then um, I worked on a game called Murder on the Zinderneuf with another uh, Toys for Bobber, uh, Robert Leyland. And uh, he in Murder on the Zinderneuf we used a posture uh, style based system of conversation. So you were trying to solve a, a murder mystery 
and you would adopt a posture like I am aggressive and I'm going to, you know, ask a question of this particular uh, suspect. And depending on which investigator you were and the posture you adopted and who they were, you would have a sort of a different quality of result. So for the tiny bit of work I did on Starflight was sitting down and going over that conversation system with Greg. And that influenced how the conversation system in uh, Starflight worked. So I was all into that. And then I played Monkey Island and I saw the amount of humor that you could deliver by showing simultaneous options for what you were gonna say. And uh, I thought this is just the best way, <laughs> way to do it because I don't take myself too seriously. And I love this one writer, Jack Vance, and the way that every single character you meet, doesn't matter if he's a protagonist or like the lowliest character you just run across on the road and he's squatting in the mud. They all have these very complicated motives, always very self-serving. And sometimes what someone takes totally seriously is just utterly funny to the player. And so I thought this is a great opportunity to help not only offer this variety in, in what you see of how, how you could act, but then also in how other aliens can portray themselves. So they can take something really seriously and you can mock them for it, or you can dive right in with them. And let's, let's find out about all your different cultures, Thridash. So once we did that, once we came to the conclusion that we were gonna use this um, sort of a node, which is your set of possible statements that you could make, um, then it was a matter of sort of defining the system by which you interacted with that collection of phrases and then how you moved from one set of phrases to another and whether when you chose a phrase it disappeared or was replaced in the list. And real quick, one last little anecdote related to conversation, which was Errol and I, for a hot minute, worked on a text adventure for a company called Synapse Software. And they were putting out this new, it was called BTZ, the Better Than Zork scripting language for text adventures. And Errol and I just said, heck, we can do this. <laughs> let's, let's make a text adventure. So we created this story uh, tentatively called Small Town. And it was sort of like a horror. Uh, it was a returning to your small town. You know, your parents had been killed and, and uh, you were sort of returning and you had kind of incomplete memories about the horrible things that happened to you as a child there. And anyways, this fun horror story that never actually got done. But we did learn one day, someone said, oh my God, I have figured out the analogy to explain interactive fiction. It's a maze. And it's a maze of rooms and corridors. And the rooms are subjects of conversation. I am talking about this thing. And what you're trying to do is find a door, which is the statement in this analogy. It's the statement or the question that you ask that changes the subject matter of the conversation. And ultimately what you're trying to find is the place in the conversation maze where there is the treasure, which is the you know, game state that gets changed or the bit of information that you acquire. So that was a rambling, massively digressing answer to your question. <laughs> I hope I got there. Oh, I, I, the question... I, I preach the fill-in, so yeah. I think the question was how did we <laughs> make it so that an open world could be navigated to finish the game and what that what that meant to me was we had to have alter, alternate ways to achieve everything you needed to achieve because you might not find the thing we wanted you to find in this obscure star system so uh we had to we had to analyze every everything that you needed and figure out alternate ways for you to get it if if you didn't get it the way we want we expected you to get it yeah i mean it, that's that's it you send them along a line and then it's like well i don't have this device i mean at one point there's uh i don't know if it's the sun device i can't remember exactly but you know it's pretty much in game described as we don't know what this is but here and and someone just hands it to you and, and it ends up being critical down down the line but uh, you know, it, uh, I'm sure that there were many challenges there. It's also fun to kind of hear the, uh, and I, I assume this has been a, a very, a, a career long professional, uh, ongoing kind of synergy or, and probably occasionally antagonism of, you know, the, the, this is what it means as, as far as trying to tell a story versus this is what it, uh, from Paul versus this is what it means from trying to program that from Fred and, uh, 
I appreciate both perspectives and, and uh, how that came together. On the programming side, do you uh, is there any licensed engine stuff that's in here? Did you create all this from scratch? Like where, what kind of what kind of uh, the components that went into building the game and, and putting it together? Do you feel like you know this hadn't ever been done, so I had to do it myself? Versus oh yeah, we were able to grab you know like kind of can you help us uh, the, the pieces? Yeah, well, yeah, like I already mentioned, we. I grabbed uh, some mod code to start with, but as Paul mentioned earlier, back then there was no really connect, real connected internet where you could Google something there. Google didn't exist yet. Um, so it was really hard to find um, help that way. There, there were books being published, which you could buy and sort of examine algorithms and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, for the most part, I just did everything uh, through necessity. Like, we, we want to be able to do this? OK, how, how am I going to do that? Um, and uh, I definitely did use some books and some, uh, that like the mod code. And so I wouldn't say I did everything from scratch, but it was most, most things from scratch. And uh, especially our font technology. Yeah which I'm very proud of. Really? The font, the font technology stands out for you? <laughs> this is a bit of a running joke. But yes, ours was one of the first games, not only with well-defined variable width characters, but also with kerning. Uh, so, you know, a lowercase o fits nicely under an uppercase t. And I am a bit of a... I wouldn't say I'm an expert at text by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just very opinionated about it. And I'd Fred say is the willing. The kerning to... there is not very good on the lot safer. Look where? at the, where? how far apart the T is from the O. Well, lots of where we are. The third response. You could mod it. The F to the E is, uh, is noticeable there. Um, uh, I, but yeah. you know, but uh, I genuinely, I uh, you know, the, I I feel I, bad now. I, I think there's a problem, Fred. We have to fix it. We, yeah, we submit it. You know, I the think W and the capital F. I, oh, I man. D just imagine how many like, I, and and it might it might be there might be dozens of us, dozens of us. But still, if you were to submit a patch into the open source project, just <laughs> like I think that everyone would just kind of like their their jaws would drop, and that'd be that'd be pretty uh, pretty cool. But uh, I, as this is completely off base, but as someone who I, I did created web pages and did a lot of UI design and stuff like that myself, um, you know, I, I also have had to deal with typography and, and, and kerning, and, and I'm very familiar with lorem ipsum and, and all of its ilk. Um, but uh, for some reason, I don't ever get the laughs that I feel like it deserves when I talk about ha uh, text having a kemming problem instead of a kerning problem. I just, you know, I feel like that really hits home and, and just not many people get it. So hopefully uh, Paul at least can can understand and empathize just how great. Girl too, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. How, how, <laughs> great, how great that humor is. And, and we're, we're just, we're on our island here. Just, uh, you know, once you teach someone to recognize bad kerning, then the world is made up of signs that irritate you. So, you know, it's it's one of the, th it's one oh of the my true, God. true things you can curse people with is like, right? Okay. <laughs> I have to I have to interrupt you yeah, right go, now go, go. to tell you something very important. Uh -huh. I am so so I'm a big fan of NASA and everything that they've done. However, the Houston Space Center has redone some of their their layout. I mean, they've they've got a new font in there, and I'm going to have a hard time talking sensibly about this. <laughs> their lowercase g in the font that they're using, I think my daughter best described it. It's a cry for help from a kidnapped <laughs> text designer font designer because it's insane um if you go to look at the houston space center website you'll see what i'm talking about and once you see it you can't unsee it anyway sorry moving on <laughs> that, that this is these, these are the insights that i really think that the, the audience wants to hear so you know if something if something strikes you that that passionately like let it fly and and let us know because uh <laughs> a cry this lowercase g is a cry for help from a text right, designer. I'll get, it, is, I'll get a picture of it. I, I, uh, you know, that that's not a place I expected this stream to go, but I'm happy it's there. You know, um, really, I mean, and chat's just suggesting Comic Sans for everything, and uh, so that's why <laughs> that's why I banned everyone, and there's no more viewers, and and you guys understand. 
Um, also, I do want to address just a, a quick technical thing. I apologize that ads do run. Uh, that's a Twitch thing. I don't have uh, control over it. It's not that I, I want to interrupt uh, uh, Paul and, and, and what he's saying. Sometimes that just happens. And where Paul is the one primarily talking, it's always going to be him. But uh, I, I, uh, I, I do apologize. I, I don't have control. And it's not like I'm like, ha, right now is the time to run an ad sort of thing. So sorry for that, guys. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, let me kind of check my my uh, sheet here about some of the ideas and things. Um, we talked briefly on it, but uh, you guys clearly have a sense of humor. Uh, how how did you find trying to write the humor for the game, and 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 uh, uh, you know how did, how did that play out? Were there different pieces that you had to did you have to approach humor in a different way, or or kind of rethink your your initial thoughts on on how to do that while conveying it and keeping it fun and lighthearted? I think a lot of it had to do with the people involved in it. Uh, so part of the humor, I think, comes from an alien race being weird, but taking themselves very seriously. But like the ores, for example, Errol, where did you, wh what's the origin of some of the ores' weirdness? Well, <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, I was at the time really, really struck by our vice president, Dan Quayle, his, uh, it seemed like, I don't know if it was, uh, he didn't seem to be able to speak very well, or maybe he was channeling a completely different universe, but he was talking about um, some, uh, I think it was some Pacific Islanders who were having some difficulty and he called them happy campers. And I was like, that's, that's, that just stuck with me as being so ridiculous and strange that the, uh, I had to use it as a form of expression, and it came out in some ideas for what the ores would say. Dan, did, did I understand? Dan Quayle was an inspiration for the ores. Did, is that that's correct? Yes, his 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 uh, like uh, when he would speak, uh, the sentences didn't seem to fit together uh, in a way that you know you were meant to understand them. There were. You know, and I think it was his inability that, that, you know, to speak and think at the same time that created that magic. <laughs> I, I don't know where to go with that. Like this is again, you know, these are the tidbits that really I, I, I think that we've we've really needed at the forefront of uh, of, uh, of of the conversation. Um, speaking of fun things that, that uh, made total sense, uh, apparently uh, there was an issue with uh, uh, some of the awards and the printing on the boxing from Accolade that went out. And uh, Yeah, this, this goes back to their, um, <laughs> their sports focus and orientation. Uh -huh. they, uh, we, we won an award. By the way, I found an image. It was the lowercase y. I stand corrected. Hopefully Dan's sending it to you. But it... Uh, so we won an award for like best adventure game of the year, which was a huge deal to us. Cause we were up against like, there were some really great games out there that year. And um, so they printed up these nice big gold foil stickers to slap them on our box. And, and that was, we were so proud of that. And then when we went and got our, it's the lowercase Y. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> oh yeah. The y. Oh yeah. It's there. Yes, so. Well, the G's it's a little Jack too. I mean, holiday but... and yeah, anyway, so I'm sorry, but that's, that should change, NASA. <laughs> you can take a man to the moon. What the hell is going on with that? Why? Okay, sorry. So anyway, when we went and looked at our box, they actually sent them to us, I think, in pride. They said best sports game of the year, hardball or something like that. And I was just like, is this a joke? And they were like, oh, we're so sorry. Yeah, we swapped them. So there's a bunch of hardball games out there with best adventure game of the year on them. So anyway, that's, yeah. that happens when you have publishers who aren't necessarily 100% behind a science fiction game. So I, I, I read that little note and uh, was looking at that, and I actually went out into my garage, and it turns out I still have my Star Control 2 box. And unfortunately, while its badge is a great value, uh, it does not have the, in the incorrect uh, stickers. So I was That I was shows hopeful. you're a great fan who bought it probably before. The, uh, it won the award. I, I think actually, because this is a this is on a CD. 
I mean, it, I I don't know. Oh, I don't know when the oh, CD yeah. release. It's definitely the PC version. It's not, you know, I but uh, it, it is <laughs> the on, initial release predates. Yeah, uh, yeah. CDs by I, quite a ways. Yeah, it came out with uh, as I recall, on three and a half inch uh, floppies, but it had a form for people to request to five to get it in five and a quarter, didn't it? A whole bunch of them. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, like, uh, I, unfortunately, I, I was a little late to the game, but uh, I, I was still happy to see that uh, I, um, I I did still have the box. Now, Errol, was, did you do the box cover for that, or did that come from someone mm -hmm. else? No, 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 not me. But I do see the captain uh, from Das Boot in that, uh, in that painting. You're yeah, this cover... Out. Yeah, Jerry Parkman, this was not our idea for the cover. Uh -huh. Um I would have loved to have Errol paint the cover. Um, uh, that's a whole, yeah. but that's marketing. You know? That's marketing, they and they, they own it. But And also, like, who is that monster? And <laughs> what is that spaceship? And the Spathy is a totally crazy ship there. But um, they we actually, up until that point, hadn't ever represented the character in-game as being male or female. And at least at that time, it was my intent to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see a real reason to do so. Once, though, they made a declarative statement that he was male, we did integrate that into the opening and closing cinematic sequences. Um, but I still think, I mean, I, I don't dislike that character at all, but there wasn't enough depth in that character's backstory to really need him to be male or female. And it would have been nicer, I think, to keep it in your imagination. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a little bit. I assume it's a little bit harder to write to, but uh, uh, you know it does allow people to put themselves into those shoes a little bit more readily, rather than necessarily to having it as a gender defined role. And this is that's coming from back when, but long before uh, a lot of the the you know the, the the kind of the social awareness to to those sort of things have come around. So you know, very progressive of you. Well, I'll tell you that Robert Leyland and I had the first gay. Uh, uh, I think maybe some of the first gay characters in games, period, and murder on this internet. And we even had a gay love triangle murder. So we were way ahead of the curve. Well, well done. We're a fully inclusive uh, uh, streaming audience here. So uh, appreciate you fitting right in there as well. Um, so I, I feel like we kind of talked briefly or, or we, we started down the line, but I don't know that we really got there. How, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on where Star Control 3 went and how did you, you decide to kind of split off from that and go down the, the open source line? Um, did I just miss where that was kind of touched or was nope, I? Okay, nope, that's, okay. yeah. So Star Control 3, the, the guys who worked on it, which was Legend, and they went off to found other companies subsequently, I believe, uh, were really great guys. They were fans. Um, they tried very, very hard. But they were threading a needle between following what Acc Accolade wanted in terms of innovation in the game mm -hmm. and then what the fans were willing to accept, <laughs> particularly since they didn't have the original writers. And um, so they put a lot of energy into the, the kind of planet development, sort of what we would call 4XE stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, they took away flying through hyperspace. and. There's this thing that I call the Paul Ritchie rule or the Paul Ritchie lesson. And that's because I have to learn it over and over. Never let the computer do something that the player would find fun to do. And while it's the case that a lot of players, you know, wish that they could fly faster through hyperspace right away, when you just annihilate it, when you make it non-existent, it just flattens the experience and makes it feel like you're watching, you're watching a screen that is simulating someone playing the game rather than being immersed in the experience. And you are flying through space, and it's you who's the hero. So they got stuck on that. Then they were asked to do sort of a 3D version of Melee. And so they spent a long time working on how do you get Melee to be Melee, but add this sort of 3D-ness to it. And we could tell that that was biting off a really hard task. So they tried hard. Ultimately, what they had wasn't satisfying, I think, to anybody. And um, so, you know, that also sort of, I think, cooled our jets on working on a sequel back then in the mid-90s, just because we thought, wow, well, 
we need some time to let this <laughs> to let this be, be forgotten. Be forgotten. And again, <laughs> the guy the guys who worked on it were good developers with the best of intentions, and I don't mean to diss them at all because I know they really cared a lot about the game. Yeah, and I think that that's something that's uh, really easily lost uh, on on fans. And you know, I mean, it's it's part of it's just insider baseball and and not really expecting them to kind of understand, but. Uh, just because the end product wasn't what they had hoped for doesn't mean that the people that were working on it didn't do their best on it, weren't trying their best. And also just, as you said, I mean, Accolade, I, I think at this point is pretty well known. Like you, it, it, at least my interpretation has been that you guys were always kind of a black sheep in their lineup. Like they, they were a sports company. They didn't really know what to do with a sci, uh, a sci-fi type space adventure game. And, and, uh, you know, I feel like in certain points that showed as, uh, as kind of been alluded to. Um, but, uh, so, so obviously the, the team coming in after is going to have the demands of the publisher who are paying their paychecks, telling them do this, do that. They don't have access to you guys. And, and they have a fan base that is, well, you know, isn't necessarily the most rabid, obviously had a clear idea of, of some of how this should work and where it should go uh, without necessarily having the feedback that, that companies do now uh and, and insights into what those fans wanted so while there were decisions obviously that we we can look back on and go hmm i don't know the precursors as cows is a is an interesting one uh certainly you know they they were i i don't think that anybody who understands how software development works and stuff is is looking at it and saying you know the problem was these the, this other team came in and just stomped all over us. It was they were they were as you said trying to thread a very fine needle. Did the best that they could, and uh, you know it just there were a lot of demands and, and focuses put in places that you guys might have pushed them into a different direction. And also, I I would say just as a as a personal note, like I don't know. Again, I I only have my own memory. I, I'm not well learned in the things, but I think that. You know, 3D space fighting and stuff was probably a pretty new idea when they were going for it. And one of the things that I, I feel like is kind of borne out is, well, as that that is true from a physics level and how it would actually be. Reality is, is for most people playing games that that adding a whole Z axis to everything that they're trying to control just further makes it that much harder to, for them to kind of have. It takes away some of the fun element in place of you know. A, Im, uh, implied realism instead of being able to just go and, and have some melee and, and, and fight and, and go around. So, you know, certainly my opinion, and I think a lot of people who enjoy playing melee against one another would agree that, um, and my feeling is in, in, in what we did in, in the Urquan Masters was like let people focus on the fun part, let them experience it as cleanly and directly as possible. So if they don't need to control the camera, don't make them control the camera, because if they don't, then they can focus more on pressing the buttons to blow each other up or to rotate correctly or to accelerate. And any gameplay you can have that that helps utilize those specific features rather than layering additional stuff on that sort of distracts your mind or adds more buttons. I mean, we had enough trouble finding keys that people could all play at the same time. So for us, I think, it, in service of the experience of melee, adding a third dimension was not a value. And I think the guys working on it probably knew it at the time, but they just, they didn't have a choice. Yeah. Oh, also <laughs> uh, back then we didn't have very powerful computers. So we had, the more we could stay away from 3D, the, the better we could have, the better our performance could be. But also a lot of people, as you kind of alluded to, kind of correlate uh, increased realism with increased fun, and there's there's no correlation to that in in, in my mind. I mean, it, it may be more immersive, but immersive is is what your life is now, and is is it as fun as blowing up spaceships? I don't think so. I I personally agree, and I, I think there's quite a few out there. You know, it can. Um, you know, this is a little side thing, but people ask me, you know, why I'm sure you know, people walk up to me all the time and ask this. No, it's completely contrived. But nonetheless, uh, I, I talk about how I don't really like sad movies and people are like, what? You know, like, it's a great story. It's a beautiful story. Why do you not like it? And I'm like, well, because I'm going to go play make believe and I want to come out of playing make believe in this different world, feeling better about things than when I went in. So I, I like, you know, where, where the hero wins and everything happens and stuff. And, and, uh, 
you know, obviously people have different tastes and, and different ideas of what they find is fun and such, but there it's just, it's the exact same thing as more realistic graphics you know, there's the ever present drive, better lighting, better graphics, better, more realism. We just want to recreate real life on the screen. And it's like that, that is certainly an immersion, but I don't look at the screen and what's playing right now and think, you know, if, the lighting off of Fwifo's eye was better and or, or a different tinge or, or had ray tracing that I would be enjoying this more. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we, we, I feel like it's almost a crutch to go to turn to that attempt at realism to hide what base fun and base enjoyment. So as you guys talk about narrowing down, this adds, this doesn't, and knowing what to take away is a huge benefit in, uh, to, to the design of, of the game and, I mean, obviously in general. <laughs> FWIFO RTX win. Yeah, there's, a, there's an RTX update coming out for FWIFO anytime, guys. Um, so you talked about performance with the with the computers. Were there were there anything that uh, you, you know really bottleneck issues that you had to work through, or or tricks that you had to implement in order to get it to be able to run on the the target specs that you you were aiming for? Uh, yeah, I I wouldn't say we necessarily, uh, or I wouldn't say I necessarily programmed uh, to. I guess I would say the algorithms I chose to do what we wanted you to play were were in, tailored for for lack of resources and and then what was still slow after that would go into assembly language. So that's part of, part of the reason the source code was lost to um, Star Control One and the PC version of Two was was uh that uh, there there weren't clouds there wasn't cloud storage anywhere and it all went on to hard media somewhere and that hard media eventually fails and um so that's how that all got lost and some of the people who've been trying to painstakingly <laughs> reassemble uh parts of the pc game uh i i finally had to tell them you know i think i prob i think i coded that in assembly language at the end, the 3DO source you have was kind of the reference C source. And so I likely um, miscoded something in assembly language that caused a slight anomaly in, in the PC version that wasn't present in the, in the 3DO version. And that uh, kind of made them sad. I don't think there's many developers these days that uh, you know look at it and say, "Well, I needed a little bit more performance, so I'm going to put C away and break out the assembly." I don't. I don't think that happens all that much anymore. Yeah, not much. <laughs> um, all right. Well, trying to uh, you know just trying to prod you and uh, Ken with a stick, see if I can't get some answers out of you, and uh, maybe bring Arrow into this, and uh, you know uh, with. Uh, with relation of when you were doing the artwork and, and different pieces, were there were there certain limitations or things that you found that you had to kind of work around or, or you know just challenges that really stand out to you as things you you overcame in the development and creation of the game? Uh, the artwork you're asking? Yeah, sure. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, actually, it was a real pleasure to work on. You know, because Paul gave me. You know, uh, broad strokes like this is a fungus creature, and uh, and then I would go off and do the mycon, and I can't remember us having any uh, headbutting. Like it, it worked out pretty good. Um, he seemed to like what I was doing, and uh, and and that was a real pleasure. Um, I just want to mention one thing about um, when I think about headbutting was on Starflight Two. Uh, I, I did some art for Greg Johnson, and that also went really well, except for one creature. I believe it was the Dweenal. And the Dweenal I presented to him looked too much like a human baby. And um, he, he asked me to change it, and I, I said, no, I'm not going to change it. So you change it. No, I'm not going to change it. So he went in and changed my art. And it was his game, and that was okay. But boy, that really steamed me. But anyway, nothing like that happened on Star Control 2. Uh, I can't remember why I did some things in deluxe paint and some not. I can't figure that out, but I'm really happy with the Utwig and the Pekunk. Um, 
you know, deluxe painted with their individual pixels. Um, but yeah, yeah I, my... you did a great job. I kind of wish there were the high resolution versions of them mm -hmm. uh, to, to kind of pull from, but uh, I love both of those. I mean, if, from my perspective, Errol's art is unlike almost anybody else's, whether in gaming or in role playing games. Um, and I mean, I, I've enjoyed it for most of my life, but I, I just find that there's nobody else doing that. You know, I mean, you can find a lot of people painting great kind of Game of Thrones dragons that look really realistic. And then somebody else comes along and they do more realistic dragons or something. But you know, when you see an arrow illustration, and to me, it just reaches in my subconscious and gives it a whack. And I love that. Thank you. Yeah, my I think my favorite is the sock fod pick and uh, the pet. Um, <laughs> but I like the Micon too. Yeah, that's. But then the pecan, I like that one. But yeah, the deluxe. The interesting thing about the deluxe paint is, like it goes back earlier, like some of the stuff for you know, where every pixel matters is a real interesting discipline. You know, you got to go back a little further, like to Starflight two and even further back where you know should this pixel right here be turned on here or turned off here which makes the better circle you know it's like or which makes the better thing that makes you think it's a circle um, anyway it, it's a computer art uh, has different levels that can be appreciated um, when you're working uh, that was the thing picking the colors right you could only have so many colors which green is it going to be buddy yeah those are those are good times. Yeah, the uh, the the limitations kind of you know the the the, hard, the difficulties and limitations almost bring out a, a different level of creativity and and it's it's in overcoming that that you're able to really kind of shine through. I I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I I actually missed that uh, limited color thing for some reason. That was really it was just a fun thing to do before you started making the artwork is what will the 16 colors be? You know, I mean, that uh, that gave you time to sort of meditate on the piece that you were going to create and not just dive in. And that's not, that's not completely wasted time. You know, it's kind of a, a, a thoughtful period. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at like the fuel tank, one of the things that I really like is that one bright white pixel, that, the way it pops it out. And I don't think if you were using you know, like one of the tools, or if it was 3D rendered, if you would get something that crisp, it would, it would maybe look more accurate, but it would be a little compromised. And to me, there is just something about pixel art that feels like it's from a different universe where things are crisp and tight and perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, and even in when, when you're flying around and stuff, like just trying to convey this shape as it's turning at angles, you know, I mean, to take this shape in, in pixel art and turn it, you know, 30 degrees to one side, how do you convey Oh, that's that? rough. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I imagine that uh, was was quite the head scratcher for you guys as you're like, does the pixel go here? Does the pixel go there? Uh, yes, I, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist and Fred would probably say that a lot more, but I would say that there were times when I couldn't decide whether the pixel was here or to the left, here or to the left, here or to the left. And what's crazy is if you look at, right. if for those of you out there who have carefully examined the ship art, you'll see something weird, which is the ships from Star Control, the first game, uh, have a different proportion uh, vertically versus horizontally. Whereas if you look at the ships that are created for the Urquan Masters a couple of years later, they're symmetric. I mean, they're the same proportions. And the reason is, the graphics cards that we were working on had non-square pixels for Star Control 1. And so I rendered the ships so that on non-square pixel displays, they would look like they were fully symmetrical. And this has, as I have been going back and doing art for the new game, um, you know, re-implementing the, the, the art for the ships, I keep goofing up and forgetting that, that I have to pick I'm not going to get one or the other. I have to pick somewhere in between in terms of the proportions of the ship. So I, I literally sit there staring at the human and going, is it the long, skinny, vertical human that I'm going to go after? And how does that feel? Or is it that short, stubby, strong, left-right human ship? So anyway, this is my life. I sit there staring <laughs> at spaceships. And 
I recently met with a, a kid I knew in high school a year before Errol even, who we were in um, AP physics class together. And he one day he looked over at my paper. He was taking notes and he said, Paul, you shouldn't draw spaceships all the time. Because <laughs> my notes were just solid spaceships. And I later, like maybe six months ago, met up with him again. And he's the successful engineer of machines that are made out of individual atoms. Anyway, he uh, and I said, you know what's funny, Terry? I actually ended up finding work where I could draw spaceships a lot. Uh, anyway, that was that was fun. But he does make machines out of individual atoms. So I think he wins. Uh, cool. I, it, it, I mean, the, to find a, a job where you're able to do that, like, you know, again, you know, it's always, it's always the dream. It's something you did and something you get to enjoy and continue with and uh, still coming up with the, uh, the future. Do you, you uh, as you guys kind of got back together and, and started Pistol Shrimp and started working on Urquan Masters 2, working title, um, did you have a clear idea of this is the story and where it's going? Or did you have the idea that you wanted to create the sequel and go revisit the world, but you didn't really know what you were going to put together until you started sitting down and having the conversations? Excellent question. And I would say that there were many ideas over the 25 years between when we stopped working on the game and when we started back up. And the, the overarching story sort of lives in my head. That's one of, one of the jobs I love to do. There are individual story elements that other writers, people like Errol or, or you know, uh, other people that we bring in will flesh out. But so I had notes, you know, on pieces of paper, in text files, in Microsoft, various Microsoft formats over the years. And so it's undergone a lot of transformations. Um, for a while there, I was wondering about, should this be about the kids of the characters in the first game? Or should this be about them themselves? And how many new characters should there be? You know, should it be all new characters? Uh, you know, should it? it so. A lot, of, a lot of it, I would say, evolved. And then it isn't just a story. Honestly, it is a game as well. So you, you sort of have to think about what are, what are the mechanics that the story requires. Um, and how did, I don't have to, I can't talk too much about the story. But uh, I would say that it, it achieved beginning, middle, and ending that I love. I would say about a year ago, and now it went from sort of throwing things at the at the paper and saying there are these like unconnected islands of plot and character and game mechanics, and about a year ago it flipped and became okay. Now it's just filling in the holes. So uh, I really love the story we've got, and I've had some help from both team members and then from Lee Hutchinson, who's uh, been a volunteer writer and, and sort of idea guy who's been helping for over a year now. So uh, I'm super excited and I really, really want to get the game done well so that people can share the story because it's living inside my head. And if I don't share it and other people don't get to read it, it will stay only in my head and I will never sleep right. Trust me, I have troubles with my sleep already and crazy things that happen there. And Right now, that story really wants to get told. Well, I mean, with how with how fun the uh, the the Urquan Master story is, then I, I think there's a lot of people that are interesting interested in in hearing that story and knowing it. As long as we're on the subject of Urquan Masters too, I do have some uh, uh, artwork that you guys sent over that we can show, um, and any insight or thoughts or or kind of descriptions of what's happening. So hopefully you have the uh, the stream up. I understand if you got bored and clicked away into Pong or something like that. But um, if you do happen to have it up, then uh, flipping over and kind of showing the some of the artwork that you guys have. Um, what what can you what are you willing to tell us and, and what kind of teasers like get us excited about it and let us know what we're seeing here. Sure. Well, what you're seeing here, this is work from George Barr, who was the other besides Errol, really the other main artist and George is a classic artist who did book covers that I knew and loved uh, and posters that I knew and loved as as a young person and he, I met him through uh, John Freeman one of my first partners uh, in gaming and they had known each other from science fiction conventions in the 60s so 
George has been an, a science fiction artist since the 60s, and he was a fan artist before he was a professional artist. And he, one of his claims of fame was he actually did makeup for The Way, the Way to Eden, a Star Trek uh, original series episode that has been mocked severely. But um, he did some of the crazy hippie makeup on there. But I loved, I love pulp science fiction, and I love people who aren't trying to explain absolutely everything. They're just trying to get, get a classic science fiction emotion or image out there. And George does that. That's his thing. Um, and so I wanted to work with George again. And so Fred and I went out to visit him. And unfortunately, George is in his 80s, I think, at this point. And he's, his eyesight has, has failed to the point where he really can't do original art. And that was just hurt me so much that we couldn't bring him in again. But what he had was a whole bunch of original artwork that he had done from the past. And I said, well, tell you what, we're going to pick some out here, we're going to buy them, and we're going to make a place for the game, somewhere in the game. And he had so many, and I wish I, we could use more. But to me, this image um, conveys this idea of uh, tracking down an ancient civilization, which is a big part of, of what you're doing in the sequel. And, you know, it's got the human component, but it's just got a sense of scale and mystery and silence that I, I really loved. So to me, this is kind of just one of the key emotional states I'm, I want us to achieve, which is great alien planet surface exploration, searching for the secrets of an alien culture, an ancient alien culture, and just a hearkening back to some of the great illustrations, this this goes back to like 20s and 30s kind of style. I don't, Errol, there was a great black and white artist from like Pulp Era. Do, do you, I think he had a name with a V or something. Do you remember Finley? His name? Yes, that's him. That's what this sort of communicates to me. But yes, yep. so, and, and this is, um, George did this with, I believe, ballpoint pen on coquille board. That won't mean much to anybody under 50. But uh, George had a style of using black ballpoint pens that I don't think anyone else uses. And he had stocked up on a particular kind that he liked to work with. And he said it was a Frankenstein monster because he said it was there was absolutely no way to back out of it. You couldn't paint over it because ballpoint pen is water soluble. And he just struggled and struggled with it. So he said he had he had mastered it, but he didn't think anybody else had. And Coquille Gord is just this kind of Errol, how, how would you describe the the feel of Coquille Gord? I actually have never used it myself. It's so. like a rigid canvas with thread-like surface mm. that yeah. picks up. You can at least on on my side, you know, it might not come through with the uh, stream compression, but I can see the texturing that goes into like clearly the the that's based off of the medium, not just you know uh, how how he was drawing and stuff. So. When you when you said that it's ballpoint pen, I'm just looking at this and and my mouth kind of falls open like, uh, wow, you know, I mean, on uh, it's incredibly talented, and I wonder, you know, like, what why did George he, is amazing. Why why was he so mad at himself to learn how to do that? Because that, that <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, it was a it was, and we're releasing I think pretty high res versions of these for people to enjoy, um, and um, I'm gonna throw out a challenge to the fans out there. In some cases, we have specific ideas for how we want to use these, and in other cases, we don't yet have the right answer. So if you see one of these and you think, oh, I, I know exactly how this should fit into the Urquan Masters universe, let us know, please. Uh, you know, we, we kind of want this game to be a collaboration. So, so uh, that's, uh, yeah, that one, I think we, we call that one the monument. Um, it looks like it's straight off of a uh, sci-fi book for me. Like I, I would expect to see a book with this cover in uh, in my school library or something, and and it would definitely be one that I would be like, I want to read this. So I I think that's that's really cool. Um, so let's see if I can actually get focus. So we moved on to the next one. There we are. And this one you can see the texturing even more. So that's pretty cool. In case it wasn't coming through. Yeah. So <laughs> this one, this one. Yeah, uh, I believe George really loved the classical world of Mars uh, in um, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars books. Uh, but there was also something that connected with a game, a D&D &D game that I was playing with Errol in some of the architecture. 
and I'm, I'm not entirely sure why, but I love this image. And I'm, I, there, there were some cases where when I would digitize a picture, I would do a little bit of depaint um, work. And, and when I say depaint, it's, it was an old classic uh, pixel editor that we used that Electronic Arts created. Um, and, but with this one, I don't know about the monsters. I don't know if there's maybe too much Barsoom in all of the image, all of the components combined. So part of what I was thinking about was this feels like a great location for a lost city. Uh, but uh, George was thinking, I think of this as Barsoom. And you'll see some of these dates here, you know, obviously these come from before uh, we started working on the recent version. So. I mean, this is, I don't know that anyone <laughs> has done this, where you take pre-existent art and you say, I love this artist so much and we can't get anything new from him. How, where's the right place to use this? Because, you know, we can paint this, we can, there's a lot we can do to bring it into the game in, in a way that doesn't look quite so physical media. But uh, it, to me, it just speaks to the, the, the George's take on the world, on, on the, the, Quad Masters universe. Errol's and George's versions are both legit and very different, but George's I, I have has a charm. It's very different from Errol's, but I like George's a lot too. Well, cool. Uh, you can tell that just by you know hearing uh, as you see them, just the the how how much um, you know storytelling and 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 just <laughs> imagination it invokes in you. So it's cool to listen and just kind of hear your take on on the pieces. So this next piece, uh, in some cases, George did illustrations for magazines, smaller magazines. And uh, I just love, A, I'm a big fan of cattle, uh, <laughs> uh, precursor cows aside. Um, my family has a long, long connection with them. And uh, I just thought that this was a cute image and the character connects on some level with our hero from the first game. And so this is one where, boy, I, I need some help, folks. Uh, what are the circumstances under which our protagonist character would have a miniature buffalo and be talking with some officious alien? I'm just going <laughs> to leave it at that. But just, um, just I love the small ridiculous writing shapes. prompt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. And, and that, he, the, the, there's something wrong with the small buffalo or. I, I see it as buffalo, like you. You mentioned cattle, and I was like, I don't, I, I get a kind of a bison feel from it, but uh, you know, I mean, you, you see. Oh right, you know, I, it's probably a bison. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to claim, although you know. Let's the, start the catapult trebuchet war with buffalo bison right now. Trebuchet, a man, a man of uh, taste, I see, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, that I think is all of the uh, art that you guys were kind of willing to share and some of the things you wanted to talk about with that. Um, Pebby, you've said uh, almost three words uh, so far. Um, what sort of things do you want to bring in from the stream that you've been seeing and, and questions and, and kind of, uh, you know, take take over for a minute while I grab a drink of water so for my voice and also just kind of let you uh, guide and, and not be dominated out here? Yeah, happy to speak. I mean, I love just listening to all of you speak. I, I, I work with these these guys every day, you know, so I hear them all the time, but I realize it's different for everyone out there. And Paul has, I think Paul is not able to watch chat right now and is focusing mostly on talking and doing this, but but you know what, Paul, they are so excited. They, they went wild for those images and um, I'm so excited we got to share them with all of you after this stream too, I, they will be posted and hosted in a place where you can go get them. And yeah, you know, Paul, Paul wasn't kidding. You know, we, we, we have a joke in, in the team, by the way, which is Paul is the best liar in the world and I'm the most gullible person in the world. So sometimes we could just play a game, which is, is Paul making that up or not? But I'm gonna say, go on record, when Paul says we need stories for what those images are, that, that is truly, a case of Paul didn't make that up. He he really means it. Yes. So don't do not worry. They will be posted to Urquhart Masters too. And um, if I can just do a, a little little pl plug of excitement here too is we have um, you know we found Zine through pretty much looking at different streamers who had played through Archon Masters or gone on record of some form saying they <laughs> love this game. And, you know, a big part of the celebration too, that I, I want like 
I'm going to speak a little bit for the team because I played, you know, I played Archon Masters. I didn't work on Archon Masters, but I played Archon Masters and I was uh, confused and didn't even think it had a story mode. But the we have people in chat from the open source community who have helped kept this game alive. And, you know, for us as a team, getting to work on something that people are already excited to hear about. You know, we get excited internally because we love, you know, I work with them. We, we love coming up with ideas and we doing that and doing that together. But knowing that there are people out there who want to hear about it and are excited about just what Paul was saying is like, if I don't get this story out, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with, our, with myself to have a community here who's like, please tell us the story. It's like, I got to say, you know, all of us have worked on a lot of games over the years and, you know, we come up with Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons is, you know, we talked about it earlier, sitting around, talking, telling stories. The idea that we get to share our story with you and you get to be part of it too, even by telling us about the story that might wind up in the game with those images is one of the coolest parts about having, you know, open source version of the game and having a community we can we can talk to and communicate with. So thank you everybody for being here. Yes, I I'm <laughs> the the amount of happiness you have given me, folks is tremendous um you know i i don't remember the games that uh how many copies of most games have sold and that isn't kind of the metric for success but i do remember uh when fans care you know when i feel like there's a chance we've done something in our games that has has helped someone through a hard part in their life or has fired their imagination um dan one thing i wanted to say is i think we've got a couple more images that maybe we can release as well uh is is that the case uh that we we didn't get a chance to show today we've got some secret bonus images we can throw up there we have we have some bonus ones i don't know zine do you want to do you want to take a moment to do it now do you want to save it as a treat for later happy to roll uh, however let me remind... later's fine <laughs> later's fine i don't sorry no no didn't mean to cramp your style there uh i oh, were you I, I think for, for the moment, like uh, now I'm like, okay, and let me check my folders. I'm not, I thought I, I thought I got everything up there. So now I'm not sure whether well, they, they were sent or, or if I just missed it. So. Well, what we could just reveal them, uh, you know, in the download area for people to go find them as well. They, they don't need my rambling about them. But if Zine, if you, if you want to go right ahead. If you uh, got them and you want to show them, go I, ahead. I don't. Uh, I'm not seeing them. Um, so if I missed, okay, yeah. No, no sweat. No, no problem. I've got the. I uh, there's there's there we go. How about uh, was this one of the ones you were talking about? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay. These guys looked kind of like Urquan. Not enough like Urquan to be Urquan, but anyway, yeah. What's going on here, guys? Need a story. <laughs> But I just, part of this was also picking out the illustration of George's that moved me the most. Because um, he had a ton, ton of great art um, and couldn't get it all. But uh, I don't know what this is and how it fits into the game, but there's something going on here. These look kind of like space pirates, maybe. I don't, I don't want to crimp your style, folks. I uh, I'm just I'm just looking at this and, and thinking like for me I almost got l like less Urquan and more Vux from it. I mean obviously not with the tendrils but with the the mouth uh, formation and stuff a little bit. Um, but then then I had the yeah. thought of uh, is that the uh, creature that that you you contained and, and took to them and and broke free on on uh, oh, the Vux beast at, yes at the, at the menagerie yeah. Um, so, but or uh, something new in a new region of oh, space. Yeah, there's al there's always there's always new things, you know. But uh, no, that that's a that's a really cool piece as well. And I'm sorry that uh, I almost missed it. I I had thought that I'd gone through them all, and then you were like, "Wait, no, there's more." And I'm like, "Hey, there is. Here it is." So apologies there. Now this, I almost feel like Greg should use this. He has a great reptilian race in Starflight, and uh, Greg Johnson. If I say Greg, that's Greg Johnson. Um, just I. I love this one. This is from 78. This is from before we graduated high school, Errol. Mm -hmm. But it looks like Space Wars is being played down there in that round mm -hmm. screen. Mm -hmm. Again, we have no idea. So if you, <laughs> if you folks have any... I lo like, we, we have special sneak previews to to Urquan 2 images, which we have no idea how they fit into the game or what we're going to do with them. But here you are. 
And, Has and, anyone ever done this? I, and we, I mean, can you imagine us trying to convince like a major American corporation that we should do this? We should go buy art from this wonderful artist, show it to everybody in advance and say, what should we do with this? I would not have lasted long at Activision or probably any of its competitors with this approach, but we get to do it now. And I think it's cool. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And I mean, all this art is just really, really cool. And, and it's got, the, it's interesting to see how it's like, it's this fusion of, of retro, I mean, in, in genuine authentic retro where, I mean, that's the kind of era it came from, but just while also integrating in futuristic and, and adding both of those pieces together. So a lot of different ways and directions to go with it. Uh, so is there any other art that I, I think that's all of the pieces that I have. If there's anything else I missed, then, then feel free to argue and yell and, and poke me and I'll do my best to respond in an, in a appropriate manner. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, we've kind of talked a little about where Urquan, uh, masters was and where it came from. And, and, you know, we, you, you've got the, the foundation and pieces building for, for UQM2 working title. Um, what, uh, like, is there, is there any other details? I think, you know, cause everybody's going to be thirsting and wanting de every details. Like, you know, how is development coming? Do you, are you feeling good? Are you feeling, you know, is it still so early you have nothing to say or show or, or do, or, you know, are we seeing, you know, uh, uh previews that we can give exclusively give here in just a few minutes time? I, I wish, <laughs> I, I mean, Dan's the master of all of that. I think one of the things that is also quite different about what we're doing is I, I am very careful with the story that I am very cautious about revealing because I think it's sort of got one time value and I don't really want to spoil it. But Dan is actually implementing the game live uh, sometimes on his stream. So we're, we're being very open with the way we're tackling some of the problems. Now, one thing that's interesting about Fred's development system that he's he's creating is it has no graphics or it has very limited graphic capability. And then there's sort of like a, two programs running. There's Fred's simulation engine, which is what Dan is scripting. You know, what are the actual game entities that are moving around and interacting with each other? And then Ken on the other side is sort of interpreting that world graphically. And that that's going to be the beautiful world you see in the game. So what Dan is showing off is primarily the simulation world. But every now and then, I think we are releasing little bits of, I think I've been, I've got a couple of um, UQM1 ships I've been working on lately using our um, sort of light mapped 2D technology that we have found to be a good uh, way to interpret this style of, of game. Um, but uh, okay, so Dan, is there anything else that we were going to talk about today? Because, like I said, I, given my druthers, I will talk too much. Well, you know, you have you have the story in your head, and we want to get it all out, but we just need to make sure people are prepared and their brains don't explode. So the only thing, the only thing I wanted to throw out is that link that we put in chat, where you can see those five images we showcased. Also, is a um, to celebrate our our anniversary is high resolution scans you're able to obtain of some of the George Bar originals that have been floating around on the internet for a while. So if you want if you want hundreds of megabytes and tons of pixels of George's hand painted artwork, and you know the thing is the artwork wound up in digital form, but it started in you know the physical realm, like those images you were seeing. If you want to see that, that's something we just released now, just to celebrate. So that's that's for all of you. That is our gift. It is not a spoiler. You've seen it. You've seen it before, but now you get more pixels. So for everybody who wants more pixels in games, uh, there you go. I do want to commend uh, some of the artists like Damone, who worked on the high res version, the uh, remastering of the Urquan Masters. I don't know, Errol, if you've seen, he, he repainted um, pretty much every communications image uh, in high resolution, working with nothing but the low resolution. Um, and I think, I don't know if he did all of them or just some of them, but the ones that I've seen, he, he did a great job on. Not sure I've seen them, but I would like to. Okay, just, to cool. uh, just to determine whether I have or not. <laughs> oh, nice planet you're gone there, by the way. I know, That's right? Uh, this Lucky. Is, this is this is the good this is the good find right here, and uh, the trick is to not max out your cargo so you get every last one. Because if you roll over one of these, 
when you only have 10 spaces left, even though it's these are in their teens or even uppers, then it will only fill that 10 and you're done. So, you know, just a little little in, insider tip yeah, right this there. Is 1990s era space technology, you know. It, <laughs> we we didn't have we didn't have compactors then, so uh, you know. I, I, I don't know if you saw earlier, I landed on one that uh, I, I didn't look at the temperature and it was, you know, 5,000 degrees and it's just immediate flame. And so <laughs> the lander came down and first thing was just zoop, right back up. Um, probably my shortest playthrough was one where I, I started a new game and, uh, you know, put everything into my turning and thrusters and, and threw on another mineral thing and then uh, went and uh, lost my lander on uh, v, uh, Mercury. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was early, you couldn't sell or, or if I just didn't, didn't occur to me or, or whatever. But uh, um, I was like, well, I have no money to buy another lander and uh, uh, I, I'm here. So this is where the captain's story ends. And it wasn't the most glorious comeback of the uh, Alliance of the Stars. So, um, you know, I've, I've hopefully had better, better uh, encounters since then. Um. Uh yeah, so... Um, you know, I, something that we talked about once about doing, I, I think one thing we, we can't, we probably can't answer even a fraction of the fans' questions, but if there's a couple that um, that you or Dan think stand out, I think maybe we could answer some of those. Sure. Maybe four or five. Yeah. Ho hopefully uh, Dan's got that, because as I've been kind of talking back and forth and trying to do the game, I haven't been as connected with what's being asked, but I know that he's been noticing questions and stuff. So, uh, Dan, what are the ones that uh, you really feel like the, the fans ask that you think that are available for answering? Well, the good news is Paul will talk forever, so <laughs> you're going to get a, you're going to have 20 minute answer to this question, but I just want to start with one that does get asked frequently, but what's the deal with your floating hint dispensing heads disappearing from the final release, huh? So, um, Fred and I had worked up a head of steam about our relationship with Accolade, <laughs> and we thought a kind of funny way to solve two problems, one, we needed a place to, to dispense some hints, uh, was to actually have two kind of strangely disembodied heads that were actually me and Fred, uh, either pretending to be Dogar and Kazon or actually Dogar and Kazon. And you could ask the disembodied floating heads of Paul and Fred uh, questions. And in retrospect, it was rather self-serving and overreaching, given that we really needed to turn the game in. And so we ended up shelving it. But I got to say, I really loved the art. Uh, it was, you know, for 1991 era, digitized, animated heads, floating heads. It was quite good. Although Errol later, I got a shout out to Errol and floating heads. We worked on a game design called Minions, which in a, in a way was a precursor to some of the stuff that we later did in Skylanders. But Errol, the main character, parents were evil. Mm. He wasn't super evil, but his... The good guys roll in at the beginning of the game and kill his parents, chop off their heads, and the main character runs and has to flee because everyone wants to kill him too because he's of an evil family. He grabs his parents' heads, he sticks them in zombie juice, and throughout the game he's carrying his parents' talking zombified heads around. And just the idea of, of these parents who would never stop talking to you about what you've done wrong because they're zombie heads now in zombie juice. And Errol did this great illustration, and I hope we can share that, because that is a great, weird-ass illustration. Oh, thank you. I, I, yes, that, I really like that illustration. And um, I, I'm sure, I hope, I'm pretty sure I have it, so I'll send it to you guys. Awesome. So uh, let's see. So we, we ran out of time. And also, I got to feeling like it was a little too self-serving to use our to picture ourselves as gods. I don't know why that would seem outlandish, but I did. Also, they would have wanted to play to uh, play test it in QA, and we didn't want to to think that time into it too. So, but I think the game actually hints that there's something at Groombridge, which was where the, our conversation was going to be. And of course, it never delivers that because we didn't put it in. Speaking of uh, never delivering, I uh, got it, got enthusiastic with that treasure world and spent all my fuel. And so I think I'm stuck out here. And since I haven't touched a base with the Melnor, mate, I don't know if they're going to come and save me. I don't think they will. I think I'm just here until Silandro probes eventually. Give it a minute, a minute or two. 
Melnorm will come. But, but I don't. I don't have a. There, there's a, a. Yeah, and he just came from a one. I don't have any biologicals either, so I don't know if they'll take regular credits or not. They'll, they'll strip your ship. They'll strip your ship. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, here we are. It's it's capitalism, man. Capitalism. Sorry. That's that's how you know. Pay attention to your fuel levels. It's. Uh, I mean, at least there, there's a solution in sight, right? So. Oh well, I mean, it's been. Uh, it, it's really just been great again. Like I, I just want to speak for a moment for myself. Like, imagine for for everybody watching, like you're just your childhood called, right? I mean, this was we we I, I was not expecting it to get receive an uh, an email saying, hey, you know, we we saw that you enjoy this game long ago. Do you want to help with this project? And uh, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you guys have been happy with the collaboration. And I was eager to jump in and and see if. Uh, I couldn't lend a hand, so thank you for allowing me to be a part of it as well. I, I think this is just, uh, you know, it's again, it's uh, the game is groundbreaking in so many ways to me, and uh, there's so many different genres that I feel like have been probably more influenced than people really understand. I mean, uh, we did a playthrough of Mass Effect on the channel a little while ago through all three, the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. And uh, I know that the Mass Effect series had a had a lot of has has stated that uh, this was an inspiration for them. Um, what were are you guys aware of some of the other uh, franchises and stuff that have kind of attributed back and uh, uh, kind of accredited Star Control Two with with at least as in inspiring and uh, uh, you know something to hark back to? Well, gosh, Dan, you might be more up on that. I am. Uh, I remember we talked about this. I think um, some of the, the lead writer on, oh uh, gosh, what was it? Uh, on Hades. Oh, sorry, wrong wrong game. Which one? Oh, oh. Um, uh, I was thinking. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my brain just reset. Quick, somebody else talk while I reset my brain. <laughs> Well, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll say one thing. This is a bit of a coming soon to the internet near you, which is um, there was a, a journalist who used to work for GameSpot, and they went on to go from being a, a games writer to a game developer. And you know them, you might know them from Supergiant Games, if you played Bastion or Hades. Um, they uh, actually just sent a a really beautiful note over about this game because they uh, they reported on this game. They went on to become a game developer, and it's you know while we're here celebrating our community, uh, it is pretty cool to hear like Zine you talking about this, and yeah, it set you on this path, and you remember your childhood, and it influenced other people too. So it's really neat to hear from other developers. Uh, if you're not familiar with Star Sector, um, Alex. The creator of that game wrote a wonderful note, which we put up on our blog too. And it's it's really touching to us that other people, you know, like every creator maybe has different answers, but it's so great that somebody had fun with something and then they went on to make more fun. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Uh, the No Man's Sky is is one that definitely pops to mind as as being um, you know kind of. You can see the the foundations of the idea here go clear, carrying on into a you know a modern implementation there. So um, that that's one that I believe uh, Sean Murray uh, attributed and, and said that uh, this was an inspiration for. And just again, you know, for those of you who might be watching who who aren't as familiar with the game, uh, you know, obviously this the the audience is a intermix between people who normally watch me. And, and what I do, and then also obviously the fans of, of the game and such. But if you're not familiar with it, it's just there's so much history and, and things that you do know that are derived from from ideas and principles brought about here. Um, so again, I, you know, without wanting to get too expansive, uh, I just, you know really appreciate it. And I, th I think that there's there's a lot of people that owe a lot of uh, credit back to you for that. Take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so we, you talked briefly to kind of go back to the programming side a little bit in, in UQM2 uh, about how you're working with uh, two different perspectives. There's the scripting engine, and then there's the graphical engine. And I, the scripting is done by Fred, and the graphical is done by Ken. Um, is the scripting engine, is, is that's I believe that's called Simple, isn't it? And is that something that you've implemented and built yourself, or is it a licensed product? What like Tell me a little bit yeah. about the programming side. It's it's um, it's a physics physics simulation that you 
uh, that you um, that the designer uh, influences with uh, with a scripting language, and and it's it's multiplayer out of the box, multiplayer over the internet out of the box, and um, you just uh, the designer doesn't have to know anything about networking. Uh, that's all abstracted away from them, and they just design their simulations and uh, can connect with other people to play with them. And Dan, Dan probably can get more into the design aspect of that, but um, so you, you don't, uh, the, it doesn't really care how the simulation is being viewed, which is why there are two separate parts. And it, it just runs the simulation responding to keystrokes. And it's depending on somebody out there to catch, to sip from the simulation stream as it happens and render what's, what's going on. And that rendering can take any form that, that the end, end user of simple wants it to take. And in fact, can take different forms on different devices, but the thing that's constant is the way the simulation runs. So even if the way you're viewing it is different, uh, you can still play with others who are running simple on whatever device they might have. That sort of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that, I mean, that's a really good way to keep the, you know, to keep the bandwidth down in, uh, in the, you know, latency problems and stuff and try and avoid all that. If, if I'm understanding correctly, you know, I'm, I have a slight uh, history of programming and stuff, but I also don't claim to be, once you once you mention algorithms, I kind of tune out. Like I, I I'm just like that. Those are those are those have become magic magic words of of people smarter than me doing things is what algorithm really means in in my mind. So, um, but uh, that's it's cool that you've been able to put that together and and uh, see the benefits from that as well. Um, Dan, is there anything? I mean, again, I don't want to. We we, we want to continue to pay homage to to Urquan Masters, but uh, I, I think people are very curious. Is there you know anything else on on UQM two and, and the development process that you you want to weigh in on and, and add? Yeah, I'll add a little. I mean, um, if if Paul can talk forever, I might give him a run for his money on uh, developing games and process and things like that. So. You know, one thing I just want to say, I've, I've been working with the team here for a while, and the unique aspect to the way we work, and if you watch, uh, if you ever watch my stream, you might be bored or confused out of your mind, um, but we really believe that designers should have the authority to try crazy things. So, you know, when we introduce those images and say, what are these about? That really is our creative process. You know, finding fun, I'm going to borrow some of Fred's words, you know, there isn't a formula for fun, or we would have all been doing it already. So one of the things about making Urquan Masters 2, well, there's a few things that are special. One of them is we learned at Toys for Bob just how important it is to let people try stuff and let people fail. And let me tell you, I prefer to fail with nobody watching, which is why I stream myself working. No. Um, but you know, if I don't need to talk to an engineer, then I'm much more willing to try something. I'm much more willing to fail and create a mess because I've only messed up my own life. I haven't messed up someone else's. And that's that was a key part of you know how we worked at Toys for Bob when we were all, and I think everybody on this call was at Toys for Bob together for quite a long time. Um, so that's a key part of how we work. The other kind of unique thing, and this is again an advantage of doing things on our own, our own way, is we have a community and we can share things with you. So we actually, there's a, a playable, I won't say it's that much fun yet, there's a playable prototype of the new version of Super Melee right now that you can play. Um, we are releasing our tools and our content in the wild. We want people modding and having fun making just as we're making too. So like getting to getting to create alongside an audience. And like I said earlier, sorry for repeating myself, you know, an audience that's excited about what you have to hear or what you have to say, excuse me, um, is really special and a unique part of this project. We're making a game kind of in the open. So aside, apart from the story, which, you know, I agree, we've sort of, like Paul says, but also to respect the fans, we don't want to, we don't want to spoil you on anything until you have the full audio visual experience. There's whole parts of the game 
we share with you very openly. And you know, there uh, I won't I won't name names here, but one of the challenges of game development is scheduling and release dates and scoping and things like that. By being really transparent about it, we hope we can share with you what it is really like and what it really means to try to hit deadlines and what it really means to, you know, work in a sane way. So that's, for me, the process, you know, you, I think you used that word. That was, uh, that's the special thing about Oracle Masters 2. I know you all want some amount of story spoilers. Hopefully some of that art will appease you for a little bit. Um, but from the gameplay standpoint, you know, we're toying with all sorts of experiments. We have, like Fred was saying, we support multiplayer. Uh, you thought Super Melee was just 1v1. Now we can support more players. Uh, you thought the adventure mode was solo. Well, you know, part of, uh, part of the pandemic, I think a lot of us learned from is, you know what? Games are a really nice way to connect. You don't have to fight each other. So we're looking at adventure mode, um, playing cooperatively. Those are whole new innovations that we want to explore and we want to try. We don't want to commit to them until we know that they're fun, but they're part of our target. Something we learned in the making Star Control to Dark One Masters was we would try game mechanics and in some cases put in weeks and maybe even a month of work. And if it sucked, we would pull it out. And, you know, you want to do that when it's cheap. Uh, you don't want to like spend a lot of time making art and like Dan said, you don't want to, you know, you obviously don't want to do something dumb when everybody sees it and is depending on it. So I think we're going to do some dumb stuff. In this case, you might actually see us implement it online. And then we will, if we'll tell you, if we decide that what we were working on doesn't make sense. And, you know, I think we've got, you know, how much innovation do you do is always a, a difficult question. I think we're on a really good trajectory to have a lot of new stuff. Uh, some of which people won't see uh, until uh, it's looking nice and, and is much later. But I think when you turn gameplay over to designers, someone like Dan in this case, to um, implement away from someone like Fred, uh, you can try so much stuff and get so many ideas put together that then instead of looking at your game and seeing where is it empty and sort of saying, oh, let's let's put something innovative over here. You sort of have this array of sort of ingredients and you can say, you know what, that feature there, let's let's take that one, let's drop that one. I mean, maybe that'll, you know, we'll, you know, do an add on later or maybe then if we do a sequel again, 30 years later, that'll be there. But uh, so that's the big difference about how we're making this from how we would have done it in a larger company, which was we would have had probably 100 times the budget, but we would have had to have everything sorted out from the get go and vetted it through a bunch of committees. And a lot of the crazy stuff would get trimmed out before it ever got a chance to see if it was fun or not. So I hope this this won't be as sort of as, I guess, polished and whiz bang in a major motion picture kind of presentation as you might have seen of, you know, a game that had a $100 million budget. But what we hope we get to trade off with that is some intimacy in terms of connection with our fans about what we're doing and why, and also our opportunity to really try crazy stuff and hopefully stumble on some things that no one's ever done before. Well, and I, I assume with the development of, of the Melee and Super Melee that uh, it does help that you're no longer constrained by uh, the maximum number of keystrokes that can be entered in a keyboard at once across the two players and uh I, I remember i remember that one where it was like uh certain keyboards trying to play against someone and it's like the the eighth key press when when everyone's holding the keys down didn't matter and you're like that i lost because of that so uh we met one game developer this guy named andrew leaker uh and he uh, told us he was a big fan of ours and he was making his first big computer game and then he told us that our game, he believed, had contributed to his repetitive stress injury, which eventually required <laughs> surgery because he and his best friend in high school would cram their hands into these crazy positions in order to both play the game on the same keyboard. And we were sort of waiting for like the shoe to fall where he would then like say, you ruined my life. But no, he was totally excited to play. So we were happy about that. And he was a really nice guy. You know, you expect a lot of things, but uh, uh, coming from game development and, and creating a hit like that, but uh, not so much to be accused of ca causing RSI in someone, I suppose. I shouldn't laugh. Sorry. The, I'm I, taking this very seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very seriously. And, you know, I mean, things go in, things go in unexpected directions. And uh, um, so I, I appreciate just, you know, again, how much you've inspired. Like, again, I don't want to keep going back to it, but just... 
this this game was a stepping stone that led to so many games in a genre that I still feel is tragically underfilled. And so, you know, that's I, besides just wanting the more of the story and more of what we what I had before. Um, I just to, to be to get a new a uh, new star exploration game and uh, to kind of go into that and be able to do four X across the stars, so to speak, and and all that. Like that's very exciting and and uh, interesting to me. So. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, that is, that's really cool. And I, I don't think I've, I don't think I'm alone in that. I feel like there's quite a few people watching, uh, that, that have that. Um, one thing that I kind of see recurring in the chat is just, you know, are there like little story tidbits that didn't make it in the game that you feel like are, are interesting to, to comment or note? And, and obviously this is probably going back to Paul primarily, but, uh, you know, like, if, I guess round at, round about, uh, or round, rounding the characters out things that, uh, did you know that this is can canonically what happened with the wig or, or anything like that, that you can, uh, throw out there? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, that's really hard. The characters are all still kind of alive in my head. Um, you know, wow. <laughs> well, I'm I, gonna, I, I'm gonna help you here, Paul. Thank you. I, thank. I, you. I, one of the techniques we use and will continue to use is to not fill everything in, uh, and to let you use your imagination because there's nothing worse than getting a book for me anyway that just tells me everything and leaves nothing to my imagination and. That's one of the things that I learned from reading Jack Vance's is just a sketch of something that gives you an impression can let you fill in something with that's that's really interesting and might not have been possible if he had spelled it out in gory detail. So I'd say there's there's bits and pieces of canon that are, are that probably are already obvious, but the the rest of it uh, we want you to have fun with. Yeah, I I know what the Urquan blasted at the you know bottom of the ocean and in Antarctica before they put up this slave shield, but what I think it is is probably not as good as what some of you all have thought is there. And I know that may not be satisfying, but I think it's you know maybe if if someone buys me enough beer, I'll tell you what I think it is. But I think I I so much support what Fred said, which is. I don't know how we how we give people permission to write their own story uh, within ours. You know, it's, it's, we want you to tell a story that's more relevant to you than anything we could come up with. And whether it's the story of someone who goes out in space full of the desire for revenge and blows up every enemy alien he encounters, or whether it's someone who just comes from a background where that's not acceptable and he wants to find the peaceful solution or she wants to find the peaceful solution to solving this crisis with the Urquan. Um, I, I, that's where I, I, one of our very first play testers was our producer at the time, Pam Levins, and she didn't want to fight at all. And so she made sure that you could play the game with an absolute minimum number of fights. And it, I, I had no interest in that. I was all interested in blowing stuff up, but it was seeing her and the fulfillment that she got from playing the game in that way that inspired us. And so, but that wouldn't have happened if we had made decisions about everything. So yeah, I'm just reiterating what Fred said. Right. And I, I completely, I, I completely respect just wanting to leave those gaps open and letting the, uh, the viewer create their own story. But what, what happened to the Androsynth? Like that, that aside, I, I need to know, like t what, 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 where did the Androsynth go? I don't, I don't understand. Like, you know, tell me the story. Okay. I mean, that will be revealed. Oh, really? That, uh, I'm that, not going to say that, anymore. That's, that's one of the biggest UQM two, uh, two teasers we've received uh, yes, so is. far. So, um, yeah, like that, uh, honestly, in terms of everything, like that's one that, you know, I just was always kind of like, what, what, what happened there? And again, I, I, I said it kind of jokingly, but it's there. There's a combination, and it's the yes. I, I don't disagree with the interpretation of you know. Let's let the viewer create their own story. 
but part of it is we also really enjoy your stories and and, and sometimes you just want to be told you know like uh, you want to sit around the fire and, and hear a story told so it, it's definitely finding a mix between those where you're we're able to appreciate what you bring but also not have the stories spoiled for us at the same time so that's quite the Hopefully I haven't done too much there no but uh, really I... unleashing that but yes that is that that will be part but that that sounds that, that, that actually sounds really <laughs> cool because there was a there was a you know that was a really interesting line and in how all that worked and I mean I there the game is uh, obviously I've played it a fair amount and uh, you know I, I certainly don't claim to be an expert but in any of it but some of the things that really stand out to me was um, visit was the experience and and the eeriness that you managed to put into these graphics this game this engine of having uh, of sending a lander down to a, uh, a, a, a planet that's just full of broken cities and one, one guy figures out what happens and he destroys all the evidence while ultimately getting taken or, or whatever it is you want to say. Like in the midst of, of everything else going on in this game, there was such a stark contrast and so interesting that the, the, it was so creepy uh, even more so than than the the uh, Erlu and their I've been watching you sleep all along, like that's creepy in its own right. But man, the mystery of the uh, of, of visiting the Androsynth world was was really top notch and well done. So it, it, that that always has stood out to me. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, again, I I don't want to you know just keep dragging this out. I'm I'm uh, I'm running low on kind of things that are at the forefront of my mind. Uh, is there any other questions, Dan, that you have, or or do we want to kind of start just throwing out some final thoughts and things we want to say about what was, what will be, etc. Yeah, I actually I have, I have one because I've I, I'm cheating. I've talked to Paul about it. And we've, you know, I hear I hear about it sometimes. So I actually kind of want to ask everybody, not not just Paul. I want kind of want to know everybody's thought on it. It seems like a good one to look back and close on. Which is okay. It's been 30, 30 years since this game. Um, one of the things we were trying to do with Orkon Masters too is make people feel like, hey, if you played the original game, you can come in and be welcome in this universe. If you're new to the universe, cool, come on in, join us. But part of what we're going for, and this is a word that gets tossed around a lot, is nostalgia. What what's nostalgia mean to each each of you? And you know, what does it do for you? What does it what does it create? Because there's nostalgia everywhere in culture. So I can call names or you can just go around. I go last. Ben still Paul's alive. Paul's gonna start talking. What's nostalgia mean to you before you forget? <laughs> I, I'm too old to no, I mean that's that's an interesting thing. I I'm trying to think about it in terms of this this game, but but I mean I know that's not exactly what you're asking, but yeah, I don't it's I it's hard for me to say what nostalgia is. I th I think when I feel it is when I, I it's really hard for me to say a specific thing that that gives me that feeling but when i feel it i know it so sorry if that's kind of vague but that's how i feel uh I, for me it's uh it's more of uh the day-to-day -day work that's nostalgic because uh we've been working so long for a large corporation that we've and we really missed uh the the development style of a, a handful of people uh manning all of the stations at once and um, doing what we want as opposed to what has been set in front of us. And um, so that's, that's the, the, the thing I'm enjoying finding again in this process. Hmm. <clears throat> this is kind of a tangent, but when I think of nostalgia, I think of how um, I think 70% of our memories are either completely wrong or modified or blended together in some way. And so going back for some reason uh, and revisiting a time kind of gives you a chance to kind of explore and think about and maybe, maybe fix one of your memories. I don't know. Um, it's definitely, it's a fun thing to do. So you're, it's kind of like you're going back and exploring something that's unknown again, even though you did live it. 
Dan, do you want to answer? Yeah, you know, Errol's answer almost reminds me a little bit, which is for me, you know, um, Alex from Star Sector actually wrote about this too, which is you can't necessarily recreate something. You never can. It's just physically impossible. But um, you can recreate a feeling. And there are feelings, you know, maybe part of the reason we have memories is so that we can remember touch fire bad, burn my finger, <laughs> touch this warm fuzzy thing, feel good. And so nostalgia is like this, the yearning for nostalgia, even though, you know, people give it a hard time sometimes and say, oh great, we're just making the same thing over and over, isn't new. It's not part of modern society. It's part of our, our storytelling as humans, which is, well, we form stories in our head. And, you know, part of the reason we can communicate so well is because we're adept storytellers and story hearers. So for me, nostalgia is, okay, I can hear the same story over and over and over. It's called the hero's journey. It comes in a million forms, but that familiarity is comforting. And something about the hearing a story that someone else knows and I've heard before makes it feel much easier to step into. And uh, I apologize, the Yehot have awoken. <laughs> so that's what I have, I think. Okay, so for me, nostalgia is about the contrast between experience and memory. And I don't mean for this to sound highfalutin, but we'll go with me on this. So one of the things I tried to teach my kids was that you have an experience in real time for actually a very short moment, and then you live with the memory of it forever. And to the extent, so it, the memory is more important than the experience in my mind, except you don't get the memory if you don't have the experience. And so for me, nostalgia is about this one, you are, like Errol said, you're remembering a much different experience than you actually had. It's going to be more colorful. It's going to be edited. You're not going to forget the boring parts. You're going to remember the really peaky parts. Nostalgia is actually a relationship with that condensed sort of super version of what you actually did. And that's always one of the challenges of trying to recreate something that's nostalgia, which is that you're contrasting your recreation, you could recreate exactly the thing that made those emotions, but a person's edited and augmented and magnified the experience. So you're gonna somehow have to relate to the previous experience, but not duplicate it, because that's just not gonna succeed. But you also are trying to recreate in someone these feelings of like, I'm lost and alone in a space I don't understand and but if you've played this game before, if you've played Urquan Masters before, you can't re-experience that. Every time you play it, you know the world, you know it more and more, and you know how to succeed. So it's almost like for me, nostalgia is about distilling out the emotions that someone goes through when they're reliving the game in their head and then saying, okay, there was a, what's going on? And there's a, oh, I just met this crazy creature. And then, oh, there's this creepy moment on the, you know, the surface of the Vilpecula star system planet. And I couldn't believe that I had this moment of horror when I was just thought I was collecting a doodad. Okay, so you, you distill the emotions out and then you try to figure out how to regenerate those emotions natively, newly. Um, it's the same set of emotions, but you're, you're trying to put the person in the same set of states, I guess. I don't know if this makes any sense, but the challenge to boil it all down is nostalgia is a super version of what actually happened. <laughs> and it's a big challenge to try to match it. And ultimately, I think it's a losing game to try to do exactly what you did before. You'll never be able to beat a person's augmented version of it in their memory. You have to come up with a new way and hopefully you'll get that right witch's brew of emotions and, and experiences and thrills. And the person will then, days, weeks, years from now, reconnect in their head the new experience that we're offering with the old experience. And if we've done it right, their imagination will reconnect it into this perfect unified whole. That end. I missed the part after go with me here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Thankfully, Dan took notes. Yeah. As he always does. No, I I fell asleep too. No, I, I love you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's always Your good. Family to be is evil. It's always good to be respected <laughs> in the workplace, right? Um, yep.
I trust me, I've had like, it's gotten so bad that I can actually do their disses to me before they do them. <laughs> Well, that, they're, they just need to be more energy. creative at that point. Like, I mean, come on. If you're getting predictable in how you're going to take them down a peg, then you got you to gotta find new methods, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like it's very interesting takes and things that, you know, when you're trying to design particularly a new game that's tied into such an old one, you've, you, that's a very, very fine line that you guys have to navigate and to walk through and you can't just do the same thing over. And there's many examples of, of that, of, of people trying that and, and failing. One of the games that I found to be very, uh, like, like just groundbreaking. And I believe it, it was an indie game, uh, is was Subnautica and uh, putting putting the player in an in, in an almost entirely submerged ocean world and and you you know existing while swimming the depths and and dealing with the the horrors therein um, and it was a very very well written well done game and and just you know the the people talk about the terror of being in that water and and not knowing what was going to show up out of the depths kind of thing and and having to learn that. Uh, and then, you know, a sequel came out and, and many people complained that, that just didn't have that same feel. It wasn't as good. wasn't, you know, didn't have this, didn't have that. And while there's things that you can certainly nitpick and, and find problematic with the, the storyline and stuff like that, I think that people are underestimating the amount of them wanting the next game to give them that same feeling they had in the first one, which is a, a feeling that cannot be recaptured because it's a, it's a, it's a first time experience. It's, you know, a, a sense of wonder of, of fear. And it's when you've played through it, when you've experienced it and it becomes routine or, or expected, then the wonder is kind of lost and you can always appreciate it, but it can't be wondrous to you. And uh, so I, I imagine that where you're at and things that you're trying to deal with is is finding that tie-ins and, and those pieces that are like, yeah, this is familiar and, and as you, you, you know, to, to use the word nostalgic to me, but isn't something to where um, you're, it, it's, it's relying on the exact same mechanics and the exact same thing so that people get that exact same sense of wonder because you can't ever go right back to that moment. He said the deafening silence, but, uh, you know. That's, a, that's a pretty screaming good wrap up. Want. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, well, I, I know that, uh, you know, Pistol Shrimp is, a, is, is just you guys. There, there's, it's, it's non-corporate. I mean, there's always some corporate, you know, but uh, it, it's just you guys, and you're, you're kind of striking out and just want, trying to make the game you want to make. Uh, I believe it's entirely fan-funded. Is that through a Patreon, I, if, if I recall? It is. Yeah, we are 100% supported by the community right now, and... I, I am here to talk about it forever, which I won't do, but I would love to share a link if that's all right. Absolutely. Um, be sure to check out the Patreon if you've enjoyed Urquan Masters, if you want to help encourage and, and move along the development of Urquan Masters 2, support what uh, they're doing, um, then be sure to look into that and see if you can't help be a part of it as well. Um, and again, I've said it before, but thank you guys for reaching out to me and giving me an opportunity to talk with you guys. I, I, I never expected to have that, and uh, it's been an honor to be here and to help kind of host and, and show through despite my terrible playing and running out of fuel in the middle of hyperspace. Um, and you're uh, a great host. <laughs> So, uh, Scene. yeah, yeah, uh, we had, we had a conversation of the proper inflection for my name and, and whatnot. So I'm glad that, uh, Errol took notes, uh, Ken was supposed to take notes, but fell asleep for it. So, uh, as he's won't, uh, yeah, I got it wrong. I thought it was like ZN and I, uh, Errol, say it again, say it again, Errol. No, uh, you did great scene. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, it, you did. Thank as, you. Lo as long as it's not the X33N, then I think we're good, you know, or x 33 That was my, I think that was my personal favorite. Um, I, people, you know, I, I understand like it's, it's a, it's a combination of letters and numbers. It can get confusing, but nonetheless, um, any final thoughts from all of you or, or do you each want to go in turn starting with Paul and, uh, uh, you know, give kind of where you're at, what your thoughts are on, on Urquan masters and, and what you're hoping for in the future. Honestly, I've, I, I've, I've done a lot. I, I thank, I, I am super thankful to have, uh, been involved in the game to have met Fred and Ken and I've known Errol since I was a baby and Dan. Um, it's been a, a format and a forum for me to tell stories and make friends and blow things up. 
and it's just made me super happy and the fan connections lately have been the biggest part of it. So thank you to everybody who's listening. I also need to thank the people on the left and right side of my hotel room because it's almost midnight here and I've been yelling and I think they've mm. run out of patience with me. But thank you folks here in, in London for not pounding on my door. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to especially the people who joined the chat and thanks to Zine for um, <laughs> making making this happen on his his dime so to speak and um uh yeah i'm i'm excited to see where this all ends up with the guys that we have and the help that we will hopefully get down the road all right errol oh <clears throat> well i that feels like right for paul and fred to to uh to finish it up but i'll just say that I'm really uh, grateful to have worked on that game and I hope to be able to contribute to this next one. We'll see what happens. And um, this has been really nice. Thank you guys for inviting me along for this event. Of course. And, and Ken? I was going to say that, yeah, it's been, I, like I said, I've been working with these guys, well, with Fred for o almost, yeah, closer to 40 years, but with Paul Paul and Fred for 30 years and Dan for quite a while. And it's it's just a joy, Dan. We have Zoom calls every morning, and Dan always threatens to record those. And there's some inappropriate stuff in them, but we just have a blast together. And I look forward to that. And it's, you know, I wasn't involved in the original Star Control 2. I was involved in the 3DO port. Um, so it's it's it, it always amazes me the passion that people have for the game. And I it, it's great that people are excited. I hope we can, you know, we will. We'll give them something that they love. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I heard, uh, I heard Paul mention uh, the word. He said the word "ass" earlier, and I wanted to tell him that there's no saying "ass" on Twitch, so be sure to be careful. I was him. saying "as." Oh, oh yeah, "as." Well, as right. if, if if he was, he says worse than that all the time. I'm I'm head of HR for our little studio, so I have to. I'll have a chat with him later. But yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. is HR. <laughs> that tells you what our HR policies are. Um, but thank you, Zine, for hosting this. It was of, great. Of course, and uh, Dan, for you. You know, I think, thank you, Zine. This is, this is like, uh, I don't know, this is the best thing possible for me. I'm just speaking me personally. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm doing with Pistol Shrimp now, I, I was not a part of the Ur Urkon Master development team at all, except that I grew up very, very close to Fred's house. So maybe tangentially, I influenced him somehow riding my bike past his house when I was whatever, six years old. Um, but, you know, one of my roles here at Pistol Shrimp is interacting with the community and getting to stream on Twitch and getting to, like, meet people like you, Zine. And, um, you know, not being behind the corporate doors, you know, where we just sort of develop in secret and then reveal our game to everyone later, being able to interact with this community that for 30 years, 30 years has kept this game alive and just seeing the amount of, like, I, I, it's sort of like an overused word, but passion for, you know, who we are and what we're doing and for space games. The fact that you, you know, you're here today to stream this and host us. It's just, it's really special. And I like, you know, if Paul brought up, you know, if my job is drawing spaceships all day, part of my job is thinking, you know what, I get to like interact with these people who had fun in the past and I'm going to get to, you know, have some fun with them again. And that really means a lot. So thank you. And uh, I think I speak for everybody who's watching and who's played uh, to Paul and Fred. Thank you for seeing your vision through uh, on the original development, for sending up uh, to the publishers and making sure to create the game. And, and hopefully, as you've seen through uh, interaction in the chat, if you're able to view or, uh, you know, at least through some of what I've relayed, um, it, it's really been a, a, a pleasure and a privilege for us to be able to have this game to to that you were selfless enough to turn it out over to the open source world to entrust uh, something so dear to you in their hands and to have them be able to carry it through uh, for years and, and literal decades so that uh, even now it's still right here in, in uh, you know 2022 30 years later uh, playable on a regular machine and uh, just as fun as it always has been so um, thank you guys for what you put together and thank you, Pepe, for reaching out and, uh, giving me a chance to be a part, uh, a small part as well. So, um, I, I think that's it. So, uh, I, I don't know that we have a, a real outro package or, or anything like that, but, uh, um, yeah, thank you guys for being a part of the call and being here. 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thank Wonderful. you so much. See you all later. All right. And uh, that wraps that, guys. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed. And again, uh, you know, it, it, I, it, it's great to be able to look in, and we're truly privileged to be able to go and jump into their uh, their minds, their mindset, and see so much of the past and, and uh, what went into it. You can tell that this is a labor of passion. I'm excited about Earthquam Masters 2 and where they're going and the fact that they've stepped away from... Uh, you know, having to deal with, with constraints of, as they've said, of, of the corporate publisher life and, and are doing this. So be sure to check out their Patreon, uh, provide them support wherever possible. And uh, as they've said, it's a collaborative effort uh, to, to uh, continue to develop and create the game and everything like that. Uh, if you're new to me, thank you for checking me out and giving me a chance to be, help be a host and, and entertain you. I, I hope you uh, were happy and enjoyed yourselves. And with that, I, I think we're going to wrap up there. So appreciate appreciate you all very much. And uh, we'll see you next time, you know, at the next opportunity when UQM2 uh, comes out. Also, be sure you're following Pebby. He does stream the development there so you can find out what's going on and, and see all that uh, along the way. So thank you all very much. Have yourselves a pleasant evening, and I will see you all next stream. Bye, guys.